Good evening. Welcome to the school board meeting of Independent School District 271 Bloomington Public Schools. Today is Monday, November 9, 2020, and it is 7 p.m. Uh, the school board meeting tonight is being conducted remotely via Hangouts Meet. It is being live streamed by BCTV and will be replayed per the usual BCTV replay schedule. And um, just want to make sure that I um, I come in on this. There's uh, 36 people I can see that are now in the Zoom meeting. Okay, uh, now we're going into roll call. So all board members present, please indicate that you're here. Director Bibi. Here. Director Bennett. Present. Director Olson. Here. Director Storm. Here. Here. Director Starks. Here. Director Steigaff. Here. And Corman here. All board members are present tonight. And now we'll go uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance. Director Bibi, do you have your flag? I don't think I see you, but I'll go for it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which stands one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, so next we have approval of the agenda. Uh, I'd like to mo uh, move approval of agenda. So moved. We have a second. Second, Laura. Okay, moved by Director Bibi and second by Director Sorum. All those in favor of approving agenda for tonight, please say aye. Director Bibi. Aye. Director Bennett. Aye. Director Olson. Aye. Director Starks. Aye. Director Sorum. Aye. Director Steigaff. Aye. And Corman, aye. The agenda has been approved. Next, we have uh, recognitions of uh, students, staff, and public. And first, we have Veterans Day 2020. And I would like to call upon Superintendent Les Fujitaki. Thank you, Chair Corman. It's my honor and privilege to share this message with the community. As we look forward to celebrating Veterans Day on November 11th, it is with great pride that we honor our veterans, as well as those men and women currently serving in the armed forces. On behalf of the Bloomington Public Schools, we thank you for your service to our country. Veterans Day is a time to reflect on the privileges afforded our communities and our country under the protection of our armed forces. Veteran men and women are heroes who risk their lives defending our freedoms, and those who continue to do so are also heroes. Veterans Day encourages all of us to reflect on the value of harmony in our daily lives made possible but all those sacrifices made then and those being made now, all in the name of peace and freedom. As we celebrate Veterans Day on November 11th, we extend our sincere thanks and appreciation to all of our servicemen and women of the armed forces, and especially our local Bloomington organizations that continue to support our schools and community. Earl C. Hill, American Legion Post 550, Eric McClay, Veterans of Foreign War post-1296, and currently serving right here in our community at the National Guard Armory are men and women of the Bloomington-based 1st Armored Brigade Combat Team of the 34th Infantry Division. Thank you for your service. We salute all of you. The Bloomington Police Department Honor Guard is making it possible for our schools through video to engage in a virtual flag raising ceremony celebrating on Veterans Day. Flag raising ceremonies and Veterans Day has been a long-standing tradition in Bloomington Public Schools. Many of our Bloomington police officers are veterans. Thank you for your continued service to our community and our country. Bloomington is proud to be designated a Beyond the Yellow Ribbon City. Beyond the Yellow Ribbon City is a comprehensive program that creates awareness for purposes of connecting service members and their families with community support, training, services, and resources. Our best wishes for a great 
and memorable Veterans Day to all. Thank you, Chair Corman. Thank you, Superintendent, and thank you to all our veterans for your service. Uh, would anybody else like to make any comments or members? I know Director Sorum usually makes the comments when we are in our meetings. Would you like to say something, Director Sorum? Well, okay. As a veteran, Navy veteran, I am uh, uh, humbled by all of the things that are going on in this. I know the schools have done a little bit of uh, a project where we would make a statement or tell everybody about what our experience was just to give the new generation and younger kids an idea about what serving in the military was like. Um, some had a more difficult um, areas to serve in than I did and so but I'm fortunate to be a Navy veteran and proud to be a Navy veteran and uh, also on the Yellow Ribbon Committee as well. So sometimes we don't pay enough honor to the veterans, but it's nice that we have the Veterans Day and it's unfortunate that we don't have the big breakfast or lunch that we always have in November. So it's just uh, a matter of uh, bad timing for this, for this situation. But yeah, on behalf of the many veterans that I know and, and work with, um, thank you for those words, Superintendent. Thank you, Director Sorum. Well, let's go to public. On the school board page of the district's website, there is a link for Bloomington residents, district staff, students, and parents to submit a comment to the school board. Submitted comments might be read during the recognition of the public portion of the meeting, providing that the comment is not related to topics on tonight's agenda, and guidelines outlined on the comment form have been followed. We will allow up to 15 minutes to listen to public comment that has been submitted prior to the meeting. If the board receives comments that exceed the 15 minutes, those comments not read during the meeting will be shared with the school board. Should there be no comments or only a few that take less than the allotted 15 minutes, the meeting will proceed. A reminder that the school board listens to the public comment and does not respond during the meeting. Typically, matters are referred to administration. Mr. Kaufman, do we have any public comment for tonight? Madam Chair, Superintendent for talking to members of the school board. We do have two comments submitted this evening by uh, Samantha Kaiser and Dustin Harford. Both of those comments do uh, relate to the topic of uh, the, the COVID cases. And so uh, it was covered in the agenda this evening. Okay. Thank you. And as um, you are aware, um, part of the agenda this evening, um, it's on um, enrollment report, uh, but also model movement update. So before we move into that, I just one more time want to say thank you. Thank you all members of the community for your patience and your support during these um, hard times of the COVID pandemic that we're we're living through. And uh, thank you once again to our staff members or our and our teachers for your dedication and to all the administrators who have been working really hard um, also to keep us updated and um, to bring the information tonight and any possible recommendations as well. So thanks. Okay, so I'd like to uh, move approval of the uh, Part A of the agenda, Part A's board business that includes minutes and personal action. Is there a second? Second. Good, thank you. Uh, all those uh, in favor of approving part A of the agenda, please say aye. Director Bibi. Aye. Director Bennett. Aye. Director Olson. Aye. Director Sorum. Aye. Director Starks. Aye. Director Steiger. Aye and Corman I. So that part has been approved and now we move into part B and first we have enrollment report 2020 and I'd like to call um, Mr. John Weiser. Good evening. Let me just make sure I can get this running here.
Good evening, Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki, board members and listening public. I'm John Weiser, Director of Technology and Information Services, and I'm here tonight to present the 2020 enrollment report, sometimes called the October enrollment report. At the outset here, I want to acknowledge uh, and publicly thank my data team who helped maintain the data that goes into this type of reporting. Uh, a, lot, a lot goes into maintaining data in this district. Um, purpose of tonight's presentation is to help us all be better students of our enrollment. This report helps us learn about the similarities and differences between schools uh, within our district, as well as the longer term trends. Uh, I'd like to take about 10 minutes of your time to uh, talk through some of the highlights of the report, and then I'll answer a few questions. So I won't, I won't be too long on this topic. I don't need to tell you that this is an unusual school year. There's a lot of data contained here in this 20 pages. I won't be able to go over all of it, of course, but I will highlight the main takeaways as well as anything unusual you might pay attention to as we go through. So I'm gonna jump around a little bit, just be patient with me and try to follow along. We're gonna start on page four. So on page four, uh, there are a few things that uh, I'd like to point out. In the top purple table, uh, we show that our district is, has 9,645 K-12 students. That's down 364 students over last year and down 274 students over projection. Director Zivkovich out of our finance office does our enrollment forecasting in the early spring and it was projecting us to be down 90 students this year. But due to COVID-19, we are seeing enrollment far lower than projected. You can see in the first line of this table that most of that change happened uh, within our K-5 schools. Bloomington's not unique in this regard. We, uh, you may have seen a Star Trib article from a couple of weeks ago, uh, and there's been some national articles about the phenomena of COVID on especially those early grades like kindergarten enrollment. In the middle and bottom tables on this page, you can see that the what the actual and projected enrollments were by school. Uh, Bloomington Online School was a new option for families this fall, and you can see added columns in both the elementary uh, table and in the middle and high school tables for Bloomington online school students. On page five, uh, it shows the makeup of each grade level by site. Along the bottom, you'll note a graduating class in Bloomington this year of 768 seniors and an incoming class of 600 kindergarten students. By way of comparison, we had an incoming class of 720 kinders last year. And so again, due to COVID, we're off by over $100 or $100, 100 students in that kindergarten class. Uh, one bright spot on this, uh, on this slide is that our secondaries as a whole have been stable from last year to this year. On page six, uh, show some of our demographic areas that we track. The next couple pages use the same demographic categories by school. So I'll, I'll walk through them once here and then we'll scoot through the next couple of pages. At the top of the left column of numbers, you can see again that total enrollment of 9,645 students. If you go down that column, you'll notice a breakdown using, uh, uh, using the federal race ethnicity codes. We are a 53% ethnically diverse district. That's 1% up over last year. And you'll see later in this report that that's a trend that has held up over the last 10 years. We go up in terms of ethnic diversity by about a percent per year. Below the race ethnicity area is the English learner breakdown by level. 13% of our students are receiving EL services and that's the same percentage as last year. Next is a breakdown showing 34% of our students qualifying for free and reduced lunch. This number is off this year, again, due to COVID. It's off by 5% over last year. There was, um, there was an extension of the federal summer lunch program that played a part here, as, as well as our multiple school models. 
Uh, we do have until December to continue gathering applications from families. And you should know that that's an active conversation among our leaders and among our food service team about how to uh, increase those application numbers. Because we know those students are out there, we just have to uh, uh, get, get them to fill out the applications. The second to last grouping of data on this page shows that 14% of our students are receiving special education services. This is the same uh, percentage as last year. And lastly is another bright spot. I like to point those out. 9% uh, of our students are open enrolled, meaning that they come from homes outside of Bloomington into Bloomington schools. And that number is up over last year, uh, up by 2% in fact. Slides seven and eight show the demographic, uh, those same demographic categories uh, organized in the same way for first our elementary schools and then for our secondary schools. Uh, like I said before in the enrollment numbers, there's a new column added on each of those pages for Bloomington Online School. So you can see the demographic breakdown, the percentage of students participating in some of our uh, service programs. Um, for Bloomington Online Schools. Page nine is a graphic form of some of that demographic data. Those, there's a lot of numbers on those previous pages, and so we try to do our best to kind of show it in a graphic format. Here we've added the percentages of students qualifying for free and reduced lunch, plus the students receiving uh, English language services, plus the students receiving special education services. The reason we take these three numbers in this demographic index is that they're high impact areas. They often drive resources, they drive programming, they change the complexion of a school. And so we like to kind of indicate here by looking at the, the combination of these three measures, uh, the, the different types of schools we have across our district. On page 10, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the district's ethnic diversity profile. Since the federal categories for race ethnicity are imperfect, uh, I put on this slide two views of how you can view our district's ethnic diversity. And I'm going to try to explain that to, to explain why there's two views here. On the left, you see a pie chart that aggregates data showing the breakdown by federal category. This is, these are the same numbers you saw a couple of pages ago. Again, it shows that we're a 53% ethnically diverse district. What's important to know about these federal race codes is that when a family enrolls, they can mark multiple race ethnicity boxes. And so the bar chart on the right is important in that it shows what we would call the multi-categorical view of this data. For example, a family may come in and mark both the American Indian and white boxes in the, on the enrollment form. And on the right bar chart, you would see a tally in each of those two columns. So if you were looking at that data on the right, you would say that uh, Bloomington has 2.4% of our students who identify partially or fully as American Indian or Alaska Native, that 2.4% there. At the same time, when you collapse those, uh, those race and ethnicity data down into that pie graph, uh, we know that many of those students are represented in the two or more races category on the left. And so that sliver of pie dedicated to American Indian Alaska Native is 0.6%. And it's because of that two or more races category. I like to just spend a little time there because a lot of our conversation uh, uh, comes with the lens of race and ethnicity. And so it's good to understand that uh, the data that you're looking at when you're having those conversations. Pages 13 through 16 show the, um, I'm sorry, I missed, I missed a, a page here. Oh, I know what I'm supposed to, where I'm at. Uh, the, the second half of this report is all about 10 year trend data. Uh, ethnic that we uh, we look at the 10 year trend of our enrollments, we look at the 10 year trend of our ethnic diversity at our given schools, and then we look at free and reduced lunch qualified students over that 10 year period. If you look at page 12, you'll see the 10 year trend of our enrollment over that time. 
There again, if you take those last two numbers, the 10,009 and the 9,645, last year's K-12 enrollment and this year's, you'll see a difference there of, of that 364 students I was talking about earlier. On page 13, 14, 15, and 16, show a 10-year uh, uh, trend of our ethnic diversity over time. That first page is the aggregate data, which again, I mentioned earlier, shows a 1% uh, increase uh, per year. Pages 14, uh, 15, and 16 show our 10 elementaries, uh, the trend at each of those 10 elementaries for that ethnic diversity data. Uh, there you can, there's one added dot on each of those pages for Bloomington online students just like we've added that data in the earlier, uh, for the earlier current school year. The last set of data, and then I'll turn it over to questions, uh, shows the change in population for those students qualifying for a free and reduced lunch. On page 17, you can see the dip of 5% that I mentioned, uh, again, due to COVID. Uh, the next three pages show a breakdown of data by site. First at, the, at our 10 elementary schools, next at our middle schools, and lastly at our high schools. I'll note before I take questions that uh, this, this report is posted online. It'll be uh, up in the demographics area for enrollment. So if you're, uh, we, we want our public to know about our demographic profile, especially if they're looking at Bloomington, looking to come to Bloomington and wanna learn more about us. Uh, we also post uh, this report in the Technology and Information Services webpage, uh, and there you can look at a history of the last five uh, enrollment reports or so. Uh, with that, what are are there any clarifying questions I might ask answer for you? Thank you, Mr. Weiser. Director Sorum. Hi, thank you, John. These are always after seeing these for so many years. It's always interesting we always look forward to this october 1st uh, report one of the things i was met looking at and seeing was the demographics for elementary schools the ethnic diversity is 53 percent and for the secondary schools it's 53 percent so that's quite an interesting um demographic that they're all this, that they're both the same for elementary and it's maintaining in the middle and the elementary schools all the way to the other schools. So that's just a, a, an observation. A second one is the elementary schools, the gender male and female are very almost 50% each. And that's, you know, quite a statistic to see that type of a thing. Uh, that's typically been the way it has been also, you know, when it gets into the uh, uh, all schools, it changes a little bit, but I just think that that's a real positive uh, factor that we have both, you know, 50% male, 50% female in our elementary schools. Anyhow, no questions other than thank you for the report and just some of those observations that I had. Yeah, I, I will say, uh, Director Sorum, that I've been doing this report for about 10 years, and uh, you're noting something that I also noted, which is uh, typically our, um, as our as our diversity as a whole tends to, as we become more diverse, we're both leading for our community. That is, we are more ethnically diverse than the larger Bloomington community because we have more ethnically diverse families who have children uh, uh, that come to us in school. And we tend to have uh, a greater ethnic diversity in our elementaries than we do in our middles and our high school. We see that starting to level off. Interesting. Thank you. Director Bennett. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Weiser. This is always one of my, my favorite reports to come out every year, the enrollment report. Um, it, it is sad to see that we're losing so many students and and as you were saying earlier that we were projecting 90 losses which is our typical trend that we've seen over the last couple of years but we have an additional 274 as a result of covid i was wondering if if you know any of the demographics of those 274 students that have left have they been pretty consistent 
with our breakdown or was it more one race or one, or was it more disproportionate those that were free and reduced or not free and reduced or I don't know if you looked at those numbers at all. Yeah, we did in um, a couple of weeks ago, we took a look at where those students were going. Um, a couple of things stood out. Uh, essentially, the demographics of those students who we anticipated showing up but didn't uh, matched the profile of the district pretty well, give or take. So it wasn't a, a particularly strong type of student who was whose family had made another choice. And then we looked um, we looked at where did they go? Uh, because one of the things we ask families when they make a different choice is, hey, where are you going and, and um, where do you think you'll land when you leave us? Uh, what we found there was about 60% of those families that left went to a uh, parochial or private school. Another 20% um, decided to homeschool. And the other 20% were scattered among the other, the other choices, the other options. So um, we do know, again, a side effect of COVID, I think, that families are making different choices. Um, it does not seem to be a certain type of family that's making those choices. It seems to be across the board, families are making decisions for various reasons. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Weiser, would you close your presentation so I can see hands? Thank you. Sure. Director Bibi. Um, I understand um, the reasons why we are losing um, free and reduced lunch, but maybe you could explain that for um, those in the community, what goes into um, those who qualify for free and reduced lunch and why the numbers have gone down. Well, we think the numbers, we, we believe that the number of families in need of free or reduced lunch has not gone down. We believe that the application process has changed and it's changed in part because we don't have the same access to families as we did in prior years. Students aren't coming to school every day, that is. And then the extension of the federal summer lunch program has meant that um, student families haven't had the same urgency to apply for to fill out the application to apply for free and reduced lunch. So it's, I think it's the combination of those factors uh, is our hunch about why those numbers are down. This also is, is a trend that's not just a Bloomington only thing. It's, uh, it's a trend across school districts for similar reasons. Thank you. Director Starks. Um, so I have a two part question. Um, do we know how our um, numbers in uh, losing enrollment is trending um, like with other school districts, especially those in the Twin Cities? Do we know where we compare? That's part one. Uh, okay, we, uh, we, know that, um, we know that we're in line with other districts based on the the uh, Star Trib article I talked about quoted data from a couple of other districts. I, I don't have it right in front of me, but um, I think we were ahead of, ahead in terms of losing less percentage of students than Anoka or uh, one or two of the other districts that were mentioned. And then we were in line with another one or two that were mentioned. So uh, it felt we, we don't get access to other districts anticipated data, the projected data. Um, but it felt to me like we were in line with what other districts were experiencing. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll let other board members go and then I'll ask my second question. Yeah, and board members, don't forget to turn your hands off if you don't have a question. <laughs> okay, Director Olson. Do we have um, information on the number of kindergartners that have been held back to wait for a year they attend school? I, I think you, I would call those homeschooled. Uh, they wouldn't act, they wouldn't be, I don't know if they, I would, don't know if I would call them held back because that's actually a different, a different form. Like, a, like sometimes they're called red-shirted kindergartners where they would be expected to be kindergartners this year and they would be enrolled as kindergartners next year. 
our anticipation is that they'll start as first graders next year, the, that the majority of them will, uh, and that they're registered as homeschool students, homeschool kindergartners this year. And those numbers are about what I had said, about 20% of our kindergartners that didn't show up in classrooms uh, are listed or registered as homeschool students. Okay, thank you. Director Bibi. Director Starks. Okay, so um, my question is uh, for uh, Director um, Zikovich. And I, I will not get too far into financial because I know that's not what we're talking about, but I do know that enrollment is closely related to uh, finances. So my question is um, if he could uh, give us a number of how much loss of revenue this loss of enrollment will be for Bloomington Public Schools. And then after I have your answer, I've got um, just something I wanna share, thanks. Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki, board members. Um, the estimate of uh, being short of budget of uh, based on this enrollment is about $2.6 million. Okay. And the reason I'm asking that question and I'm asking it tonight is because um, in the October special session for the legislature, uh, Representative Davney proposed a um, bill that would allow school districts to use their 2019-2020 enrollment numbers for funding instead of the 2021 numbers um, for this exact reason that you know Bloomington's not the only school district across the state that's losing um, students and it's in the uh, metrics of millions of dollars of losses for school districts. Um, it didn't go anywhere in October. It's my understanding that he is planning on um, proposing it again. And I just heard right before the meeting started that the next special session starts on Thursday. So I encourage my fellow board members and community members to watch to see if that uh, bill does come up and if there is any conversation on it. I haven't heard if there's a companion bill in the Senate at this point. Um, and so, uh, and then with our meeting that we have um, next week with the legislators, it's definitely a conversation we can have with them as well. So. I just wanted to um, to bring that up, just to put it on everyone's radar. Thank you. Thank you, Director Starks. And I think we would also appreciate it if you keep us informed, since you have a good. I answer. absolutely will. Yes. Please. Yeah, we would love it <laughs> if sure. you have that information too in numbers. Okay. Thank you, um, Director Olson. I think you have another question. I'm sorry, I forgot to take my hand off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other questions? questions? It doesn't, doesn't seem like, like it. it. Okay, so, so I, I think that's, that's it for our presentation. presentation. Mr. Weiser, anything else you have for us? That's it, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next we go to the second item of our Part B, which is the model movement update. And uh, then we have Superintendent Les Fujitaki in administration. Superintendent, your microphone is off. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair Corman, school board members. At the October 26th school board meeting, administration presented elementary and middle school model movement updates. Please recall that there are three state prescribed instruction delivery models. One is traditional, two is hybrid, and three is distance learning. The board took no action at that meeting to move to a different instructional delivery model. Our elementary schools are in hybrid and secondary schools are in distance learning. Administration reported that the board would receive another model movement update at tonight's board meeting. Two weeks later, we're here tonight. However, at this meeting, administration will be presenting more than an update. Our district and city are fortunate to have our own public health service, the Bloomington Public Health Department. They are a great strategic partner and resource, especially during this pandemic. This morning, the Bloomington Public Health Department Interim Administrator, Dr. Nick Kelly, and our nursing supervisor, Hannah Hatch, reported very concerning COVID health developments. Based on that reporting, administration will be doing more than sharing an update. Tonight, administration will be making model movement recommendations and asking the board to consider taking actions on those recommendations. 
Please accept my apologies for this change. However, doing more than an update is necessary because COVID conditions are rapidly evolving. Our district COVID strategy requires us to be vigilant, data-driven, and most important, to listen and value the guidance of the state and education departments, our nursing supervisor, and probably most important, a Bloomington Public Health Department. In tonight's presentation, you will hear from Dr. Nick Kelly and Ms. Hatch how rapidly conditions have changed since October 26th and their guidance based on those new conditions. We'll be referencing the model movement dashboard that has been shared in previous meetings. In this dashboard, we'll study three major factors, health conditions, academics, and student supports. Please be sure that we have high school hybrid instruction plans. However, tonight's special attention will be focused on health conditions. In addition, administration will be presenting recommendations for other programming such as early childhood and athletics and activities. We'll respond to questions after each presentation topic. I'll now ask Dr. Uh, Assistant Superintendent, Dr. Jenna Mitchler, discuss our model movement dashboard. Dr. Mitchler, please. Thank you, Superintendent Fujitaki. Chair Corman, members of the board and viewing public, uh, just as Superintendent Fujitaki just described tonight, uh, what we'll be providing to you is a review of the decision-making tools and then an update and recommendation for elementary um, and then middle and high school discussing possible movement of models. I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about our decision-making um, tools and process. And I'm gonna show you some slides that you've seen before. So the first is this one. We know that we have sort of a, a dial that we're using and we're talking in these meetings about whether or not we turn the dial up or turn the dial down based on lots of just different uh, data points. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Our process is what you see here. So we have, as I said, lots of data points, which I'll show in just a moment, but we'll call those indicators. And we put those data points, those indicators together on a dashboard. Again, you'll see in just a moment. The data from that dashboard then, um, which includes data from five key areas within our district, is used in consultation with uh, the Department of Education at the state level, the Department of Health at the state level, and then of course, Bloomington Public Health, our local Department of Public Health. Um, we also collaborate with the hybrid planning team or distance learning planning teams, uh, district school leadership, students, families, to make sure that we know what's what's truly best. Uh, and so then from there, a recommendation might be developed. And so if a recommendation is provided, the board has a decision, of course, to take action on that recommendation. And then from there, if there's a decision that's made, board takes action, there's communication and implementation. So it's just an overview of sort of how the process works. So that first item is the key indicators and dashboard. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that first. So with our model movement matrix, we have several pieces of data that we're looking at. And those pieces of data fall into one of five categories, either physical health and safety, high quality learning, school and district operations, supporting all learners, and social and emotional learning, sometimes called SEL and mental health supports. Now the matrix lists out several data points and I'm not gonna show that tonight because there's just a lot of data on that matrix. What I will show tonight is something that the board has seen before. It's a summary of those indicators and it's called the model movement dashboard. So that dashboard provides, just as I said, an overview of the district's readiness to shift from a less restrictive learning model to, um, I'm sorry, from a, a more restrictive learning model to a less restrictive learning model. So for example, from distance learning to hybrid. We could also look at it to think about um, movement in the other direction as well. You'll see the following symbols when you look at the dashboard, either a green check mark, meaning we're on track to make the model to make the model shift to a less restrictive model. You might see a yellow triangle, meaning we need to do some intervention. We're, we're ready, but it's gonna take a couple of days or weeks to ramp up to making a shift. Or you might see the red circle with the line through it, meaning we're probably gonna require some delay because of some of the data in that particular area. 
Here is the dashboard as it sits right now. And keep in mind that this dashboard is shifting all the time as our data shifts. And so this is um, up to date for this very moment in time. And I'll share just a little overview of some of what you see here. So those first two categories under physical health and safety, you'll notice there's a mix of green, yellow, and red in those areas. Hannah Hatch, who's Supervisor of Health Services, and Dr. Nick Kelly from Bloomington Public Health will provide more context on those indicators in just a little bit here. But you'll also notice that the COVID-19 data item for elementary is yellow. And so I just wanted to point out that this is because local case rate data from the last two weeks does place us in the hybrid learning model. So that's why you see the yellow indicator there right now. We fully recognize and the COVID-19 response team for the district recognizes and has been monitoring that testing posit positivity rates are increasing. Uh, and Ms. Hatch and Dr. Kelly will talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. If you look at the high quality learning section under staffing coverage, just as I've said in other board presentations around this dashboard, staffing continues to be a, a challenge for us and, and a pinch point in some areas. And so at the last meeting, we pointed out transportation. We had some specific struggles there. Um, we're also noticing there's some struggle in terms of um, covering classrooms at the elementary level when we see a teacher needing to be out for a more of a short term type leave. So those are some of the challenges, challenges we continue to, to face and struggle with. Of course, at middle school and high school, if we were to make a shift to hybrid, um, teachers may decide that they would want to take a long call, I'm sorry, would want to take a, um, a leave, which would require us to hire long call reserves. And long call reserves at the secondary level are specific for licensure, and so this would require time and intervention. And that's why you see the yellow there. Under programming, Again, you see green at elementary. We're doing the hybrid model right now. You see yellow at middle school and at high school. And this is because plans have been created. A lot of work has gone into structuring what hybrid would look like at the middle and high school levels. Uh, and of course, we're implementing at the elementary level. So you see green there. Um, but we do know that if there was a shift to hybrid at the middle and high school level, we would need to allocate times for staff prepar days for staff preparation and some of that work just would require us to take some time before we were ready to, to make that shift. The school and district operations section, you see lots of greens there because again, plans have been made, we're ready to implement, and these are a little bit easier for us to turn on and off in terms of plans. And so we'd be ready to go pretty quickly if we needed to make a shift in that area to hybrid. And then lastly, under supporting all learners, you see we have a yellow at middle school and at high school. And um, some really exciting news is that we've been able to offer some supports at the middle school uh, and high school level, starting just even very recently at the middle school level with our middle, middle school galaxy program. So there's some exciting things happening there, but we do know that we would need to, if we shift to a uh, less restrictive model, take family preferences into consideration. And that would take a little bit of time. And so again, that's why you see the yellow for re would require a little bit of intervention. So as a summary, we have plans to make the shift if we needed to, but there are some key areas where we either require just a little more time or where there are, are some specific um, concerns where you see the reds. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Hannah Hatch and Dr. Nick Kelly to provide a little bit more context around the physical health and safety indicators. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chair Carmen and members of the board. Uh, as Dr. Mitchler, Mitchler mentioned, we are here tonight just to provide you a little bit more information and data on the current case rate numbers and health and safety um, metric on our dashboard. So prior to jumping into the specific data um, and projections, I want to just provide a reminder of what we are looking at and considering when we look through this data and what we need to look at in terms of making or providing guidance or a decision around it. So first, when we look at the metric under physical health and safety considerations, just as a reminder, we are looking at several different areas and considering all those areas in this metric. One is staffing, uh, case rate numbers, the safety of staff and students in our building, and data around how COVID-19 is being spread by each age group. We covered several of those at our last board meeting, and today we want to dive a little deeper again into the case rate numbers and where those are at when we consider that um, the health and safety of our staff and students. 
So when we do look at the case rate data and consider model changes around that, we also need to consider several different things, not just the number itself. So we do want to first look at the stability of the number. Uh, we don't want to just look and make guidance or recommendation off of one week or one day where numbers have spiked and then gone back down and vice versa. We don't want to look and make decisions um, in the opposite direction off of one day where numbers have been down um, or back up. So we want to see some consistency and see that uh, we are seeing a trend around those numbers prior to jumping and giving guidance on it. We then want to look at projections. So what, what is uh, being projected for our numbers given the current um, status of case rates, how they're coming in, uh, the increase or decrease that we've been seeing over time, and what do those projections look like? We did dive into that a little bit in the last board meeting as well. The Department of Health is then asking us to consider uh, what are the case rates in our surrounding area. So they ask us to look at what is happening in our surrounding states, what's happening in the state of Minnesota, and what is happening in our surrounding districts and counties. So looking at where what are the numbers um, in the different counties surrounding Hennepin County and what is happening in other school districts around us as well. So that is something we take into consideration. And then lastly, again, looking at where is that spread taking place? So when we see high numbers in our county or city, where are we seeing that spread take place? Is there an outbreak in a specific area? Is it community-wide spread? Where is that spread taking place? So those are all things we consider when looking at this case rate data. Go to the next slide. Okay, and then again, just a reminder, um, when we are looking at the weekly and local case rate reports, this is just a starting point for our school district. So we are making decisions around that and schools can make um, decisions to operate under a less restrictive or more restrictive model. So just to remind you of that, that this is guidance um, from the state that we can use, but there is some flexibility in that that schools are using. So currently, Minnesota continues to see rise in the case rates, and now we are seeing that the case rates are also rising in Bloomington and mimicking that kind of same projection that we have seen throughout the state of Minnesota. Several area school districts are also seeing the same projection in their case rates, so we are not alone in this and we are not the only city or county seeing this um, increase in case rates. I again provided you uh, the learning model table. This is from the state guidance. As you can look at the numbers, um, this last week we were still in hybrid learning for elementary students. Uh, Bloomington Public Health watches daily case rate data, and then the state releases um, new data over that two week period every Thursday. So that's when those new numbers come in. Now, taking into consideration all of uh, the things that we look at when talking about this, I'm actually going to hand it over to Dr. Nick Kelly to dive into uh, the current numbers and charts. Thanks, Hannah. Chair Corman, uh, board members, this is uh, data as of uh, this morning. Uh, so reflecting the, the case numbers we see in Bloomington by age group. And you can see uh, it in the last, uh, Two weeks since uh, we've been talking, you can see that we've seen uh, a slight decrease in our elementary students and a increase in our secondary students. Um, uh, the secondary is the 11 to 18 age range that's highlighted in the orange, and uh, the, the elementary is in the blue. This is reflective of the mitigation uh, tools that we have in place at the district are, are working well. Uh, the staff serving our students uh, are doing a phenomenal job, uh, ranging from the, the administration with attendance and the, the nursing staff with contact tracing to the teachers and support staff just doing amazing work in the schools keeping our, our students safe. The challenge we're seeing, though, is really highlighted in the, in the next graph. This shows uh, the trend we're seeing with COVID infections in Bloomington over the last seven days as of today. So the, the, the concern that we have about the, the growing spread in the community is that steep rise we're seeing at the end of October, the beginning of November. When we're hitting uh, routinely 
uh, 60 cases on average over the last seven days per 100,000 population, that gives us a really strong indicator that our 14 day case per 10,000 is gonna go up quite a bit. That is an unsustainable uh, trajectory for COVID cases. That would be equivalent to thinking about a sports analogy of if you have a, a goalkeeper trying to keep uh, somebody from the opposing team from scoring a goal and, and COVID is that uh, opposing team trying to score a goal. We don't want COVID in our schools and spreading in our schools. And we have these mitigation strategies like a goalkeeper. The more shots you have on goal, eventually you're gonna see something get through. When we see cases going up this fast, community-wide without a, a clear indication of a, a workplace or something else, this is general community spread. We know it's only a matter of time until we see that having a, a negative impact on our schools beyond what it currently is. That's what gives us concern about uh, the elementary model right now from a hybrid standpoint. We expect over the next two weeks, we will continue to see uh, pretty significant increases in the county rate and our city rate for uh, cases impacting school. That puts us in a, a challenging situation with our, our spread in the community. Like I said, it's community wide. We're not seeing this isolated just to athletics or uh, community events. It's family gatherings, it's small community events, it's it's widespread. So those social gatherings we're seeing in the community are, are gonna have a, a substantial impact on our school operations here in the near future. When we're looking at cases, we're looking ahead. Um, COVID's got an incubation of about 14 days. And so seeing the rise at this point in early November, we know in the next few weeks, it's gonna increase substantially more. Uh, we're in this exponential growth phase of COVID infections here in the metro. So with that being in mind, we're concerned about this and seeing that that means we have to start looking more deeply at some of our operational realities and how do we keep our, our kids and our staff safe in our school setting. And if you go to the next slide, I think Hannah is gonna continue to talk about our next steps. Great, thank you. So uh, in looking at that data, I just want to mention that we do continue to consult the Minnesota Department of Health, Bloomington Public Health, and other medical advisors regarding our case rates regularly. We talked with all of them this morning again with this new information, and we've been consulting with them on a very regular basis. When you look at Minnesota State's learning plan, it requires schools to consider all aspects of safety when giving guidance around model changes, just like I talked about when we started. When we do look at our model movement dashboard that Jenna recently presented, we anticipate that several areas will be facing challenges to maintain operations as the cases continue to rise. At this time, based on the current, current and projected case rates, the guidance suggests that we consider a more restricted learning environment for our elementary students. We recommend a learning model shift change no, late, no later than November 20th. That being said, uh, we will face staffing challenges and we are facing staffing challenges currently. Um, so we will be considering staffing challenges and the health data and that may require an earlier than planned transition. With that, I'm gonna pass it back to Superintendent Fujitaki. Thank you for that presentation, Chair Corman. The team is ready to respond to questions on, these, on this information. Thank you, Superintendent, um, and thank you, Dr. Mitchler, Dr. Um, Kelly, and Mrs. Hatcher. Very um, important information tonight, and I truly appreciate the amount of time that you spend looking at numbers, really bringing all this data, digging into all the little details that would uh, facilitate this, uh, this decision too. And also, we're informing our community. Thank you. Okay, any questions, board members? I see one hand up is um, Director Bennett. Uh, there we go. 
Okay, uh, thank you uh, for that presentation. Um, Dr. Kelly, uh, this question, my first question is for you. Um, I know that there are some different uh, mitigation techniques or strategies to be implemented on the state and city level. I know the governor is speaking tomorrow and we don't know exactly what he's going to suggest or gonna do. There's been some, some hints about maybe some curfews around bars and restaurants, but I don't, from the city level, do you know if the city plans on taking any steps of trying to get a hold of this um, community spread in Bloomington by looking at restaurants or gyms or sport venues or anything like that? Uh, Chair Cordman, uh, Board Member Bennett, uh, the the city's approach to helping manage COVID uh, is is largely based on how the governor is approaching things, recognizing the the city of Bloomington is not an island. And interventions that we could implement or or put in place at the city level uh, are going to have a limited impact if they're not done widely regionally. And so our we've been following the the governor's guidance and and doing what the governor is doing as part of our our Minnesota plan, which is a solid, robust plan. Um, as you indicated, the governor is planning on making some additional changes. The, the challenge we're seeing is, is widespread community transmission. And that really is based on social interactions with other people. And so minimizing that is gonna require uh, our entire community to do things, not just uh, residents of Bloomington. Okay, thank you. Director Beebe. Um, last Friday, um, some of us were able to hear um, Governor Walls and others um, from the Department of Health um, discuss how the transmissions were, were being done. And one of their biggest um, concerns was that the asymptomatic people um, were actually exposing others without knowing it, and that there was going to be a need for more um, testing of people who don't have any of the symptoms. And I know we had one um, situation at Kennedy where we had a testing site here, and I'm wondering if there is any talk or concern about doing that in, in Bloomington at this time, um, or are we hoping that that will be provided in what the governor suggests we do? Uh, Chair Corman, uh, Director Beebe, uh, you're, you're correct. Uh, testing is a, a key part of the strategy. And uh, what we see is up to 45% of individuals transmit COVID before they have symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, which means you, you always have to be interacting with other people in those social settings with that in the back of your mind of what am, am I doing something right now that is adding a risk of transmission to somebody else? Um, our school settings are, are set up with multiple mitigations to minimize that. Um, but testing is a, a key component to moving forward. So the, the governor has been standing up with the state's plan additional testing sites. Uh, we expect to see three, maybe four additional saliva-based testing sites here in the metro um, being stood up in the coming weeks. And uh, the governor also announced a uh, saliva test at home program similar to what was available to district staff uh, at the start of the school year for all residents of Minnesota. And we continue to see more and more testing opportunities coming online in Minnesota to help everybody get access to the diagnostic tools to make sure that they're uh, being able to make smart decisions and keep each other safe. Thank you. Director Olson. Okay, so first of all, I appreciate that our schools are doing everything they can to um, keep our students safe. And uh, we can take all the safety precautions available, but without community involvement, as has been stated here, um, you know, we're dependent on community involvement. And so I'm kind of, this is more, this is just more of a statement, but I really want to <clears throat> put this out there in relation to Veterans Day. Someday we're all going to be veterans of this war on a pandemic. And, you know, we'll, 
not everyone sacrifices the same in a war. Not everyone, but everyone does sacrifice. And not everyone has the same consequences. They're not all affected the same, but we're all affected. And I just really want to ask that the community, if everyone pitches in, you know, the people who are sacrificing the most will not have to sacrifice as much. And that includes our educators, our students, our healthcare workers, so many people, they need our help. Um, so we just all need to pitch in and we all need to make, make sacrifices. And that's the only way we're going to get back to school as usual because no one wants to be in this um, situation. This is not the ideal educational environment. None of us would choose this educational environment. And so I really wanted to say that. And then also I did want to add that I have been asked to substitute teach every day, every single day that we've had hybrid. And um, I've been in different classes and I've thought about how, yes, they're doing a great job, but I have thought about if I were to become infected, I would be going from class to class, different classrooms, and that would spread it um, out throughout different schools. So. I started to wonder about, um, well, no, I wanted to ask if we were to be in a hybrid situation, if substitute teachers would have some kind of testing available before they go to, go to take a job. That's a, that's a great question and um, one we certainly could look into our resources around doing testing. I think some of that will depend on what Governor Waltz rolls out in terms of testing and how the availability. However, if um, more saliva tests become available or different testing becomes available, that is something we could uh, potentially look into for our staff that need to move building to building in order to educate. Okay. Sorry, that was that was a long and two part question. So thank you. Yep. Yep. I just wanted to add to, to your your question, Director Olson. The uh, I'm confident that here in the near future, as additional testing capacity keeps being rolled out, that anybody that wants to get a COVID test will be able to get a COVID test here in Minnesota. Uh, but uh, a test is only as good as when you took it, and so we. Uh, testing needs to be done thoughtfully and with some intention. Um, so it, it's, you can test negative on uh, a day and then uh, you could be exposed and infected a day or two later. And so it's, uh, it's one of the tools, uh, but it does not replace the other layers of mitigation that we put in place to keep students and staff safe. Right, another challenge we would face with that is the turnaround time between taking the test and getting the results back. Uh, an individual would need to take the test and basically quarantine until they had the results in order for it to be effective and for us to guarantee, you know, the result was accurate. So, um, but like Dr. Kelly said, we are hopeful that we can get more tests so that we can test our staff, um, you know, when anyone would want one, even if they are asymptomatic. Thank you. Director Sarum. Yeah, thank you, Hannah and Nick, uh, for writing all this stuff. It really is um, really is interesting to hear the various steps that are taken. Now, for instance, do we have the kids, students, or staff when they are tested and then they're quarantined immediately? or when um, they take a test, is that the trigger? You've taken a test, now you have to be quarantined. Uh, thank you, Director Storm, I can answer that. So th that's kind of a tricky question because there's different things that put you into isolation or quarantine. So one trigger would be if you go and get a test and it comes back positive, that would place you in immediate isolation and you would be home, but it, it's, 
um, there's many layers to it. What happens when we hear about a positive test is we then interview that individual, whether it be a staff or a student. Uh, we conduct a very thorough interview with them, asking them where they have been, who they've been in contact with in school, and for how long, what activities took place, um, did they ride the bus, or did what did they do at recess? Um, all of those different questions. Um, to find out exactly what the exposure was at school. So what we do is we take either the onset of symptoms or a positive test and we go back 48 hours and at that time ask everything that they had done in that period because that would be considered their infectious period. Once we've determined that, um, they are out right away on isolation, but then we also have to determine who is considered a close contact. So if they did have close contact with anyone within the school, um, district at all, whether it be at school or outside of school at a gathering or something like that, we are then following up with those inter individuals and they're placed on quarantine. So a quarantine would then be 14 days due to cl close contact and they're waiting to see if they develop it or develop symptoms, um, things like that. The hard part is you can't test out of quarantine, so they are on that 14-day quarantine for the entire time, even if they test negative during that time. In addition to that, uh, anyone who's experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 is placed on isolation, and then it has a trickle-down effect. So any student that's on isolation but has siblings in the school, those siblings need to go home and isolate. Uh, so those are just give you a few ideas of the different things that can place someone on quarantine or isolation. But yes, if a positive case comes in, that definitely triggers an interview process, which then leads to quarantine or isolation for other individuals if needed. Great. That, that's very helpful for the viewing audience, um, myself included in that. My other question has to do with, you had mentioned there's a, a recommendation about a model movement on November 20th. Uh, maybe we'll get into that in a little while. So um, I won't pursue that anymore other than just Thank you for the thing. And it's really unfortunate to see the spiking going on because um, of what could happen. Thank you. Yeah, and, and before I, um, we ask uh, superintendent again about this, um, I would like just like to have all board members, make sure that all board members have um, asked their questions. So Director Steiger. Hi, this question is for uh, Hannah Hatch and uh, probably Dr. Kelly also. Um, I have uh, seen that there is a large percentage of people in the state that are refusing to participate in the contact casing or in the interview. So I'd like to know if you've had that experience with people in school and also if Dr. Kelly can, Kelly can talk about in the broader Bloomington community if they're also seeing that? Sure, I can start off and then I will uh, hand it over to Dr. Kelly to answer the rest. But I can tell you that um, we do we do ask permission before doing any inter any interviewing or contact tracing. Uh, we ask if they are okay with that and comfortable with it um, and go through a process of getting that permission. We have not had a lot of issues with people refusing to do contact tracing at this point within the district. However, that is uh, something that they have the right to do. So we only can obtain information that they want to share with us and it is anyone's right not to share that information with us. I will tell you that if that does happen, we do have a we do have a process and protocol that um, we will follow through with erring on the side of caution if we don't know. So uh, there are certain things we can ask around the school or hint at without giving away any identity of who a person is that tested positive and find out some information around it in a school building. Um, and that kind of helps us in making some decisions, but I will tell you that we do err on the side of caution if anyone is refusing to answer some of the questions or if there's conflicting information in the um, answers that we're getting in the interview. Yeah, we do see individuals uh, not responding to the, the contact tracers. Um, so 
about 13% of the people we try and follow up with uh, in Bloomington and at the state level, uh, we, we, they're what we call lost to follow up. They, we never get a phone call back, don't answer questions, something of that nature. And that has gone up um, to, it has gone up a little bit. Um, and that's part due to the, the, the impact is getting greater as our case numbers get larger. 13% of 6,000 is it's, it's a bit more than 13% of a thousand. Um, and so that does have that impact. We most often see that associated with uh, events or gatherings where they don't uh, wanna share information that may get, uh, have the perceived impact of getting somebody else in trouble. Um, these investigations are, are not punitive. They're how do we help the community and, and really invoking that we're doing this to improve the common good and help the entire community out, not say, oh, you did something wrong and therefore people got sick. And so that that's why the, there's a strong desire if you get a call to answer the call and return the phone call, help us help get the community back on track. Thank you. Director Bennett. Yeah, so this question will be probably for um, superintendent or assistant superintendent. Um, so when we're looking at our, our case rate data, our guiding document is the, um, the data from the Minnesota Department of Health, which as of now goes through October 24th and has us at 35 per, per uh, 10,000. So we should be in the hybrid model, but as uh, Dr. Kelly has uh, told us that we are going up exponentially and by the time that case data reflects today, we're going to be over 50. So I'm curious, I'm glad that administration is making the recommendation to ship models to, to distance learning, but I'm wondering if Hennepin County does go above 50, are the districts around us going to be forced to close down or are they going to be able to stay open? Great question. Uh, this morning, Dr. Kelly, Ms. Hatch, and I, and Mr. Kaufman met with representatives from the Department of Health and Department of Education. They are the regional support representatives. They're assigned to our district, and we consulted with them. They can't tell us what other districts are doing. They can share some insights about what they're thinking about, but we consulted with them on this, and they're telling us that we can look at county data, but we should be also looking at local data in making our decision. And that's why we're consulting with Dr. Kelly on what our data is. And we have more current data because of course it's our data for our city. So we have more contemporary data than the county data. Okay, but well, I asked a question because uh, uh, some concern, my concern is that, you know, as we just went over the Roman report, we lost about 274 students. Primary, and I, I think we can surmise a lot of that would because we started the year in distance learning, so people wanted their kids in person, they took them to other schools. So if we do the responsible choice decision and we go back to distance learning and other districts don't, even though that they're over 50 and the count or the state's not gonna make them go to distance learning, then we put ourselves in risk of losing even more students. So I just don't know. So if we were at 50, MDH or the state would not tell us we have to go to distance learning, they would allow us to stay open? I'll, I'll let, um, Hannah, can you feel that question, please? You've talked to them before about this. Yeah, so I can answer that. That's a great question, uh, Director Bennett. At this time, there is no punitive um, response to school districts who are not following the guidance. They have kind of left it up to the school district and saying that this is their recommendation and that um, if, there are, they are not following the guidance. You know, they need to be prepared to answer to their community and families when they do see outbreaks within the school or things going on that cannot sustain quality education within the school building. That being said, uh, the state did develop that list of high case rates within the schools and they are posting which schools have high case rates um, on their website. And then they are giving schools calls now to provide guidance when they do get to those levels. So they are 
trying to follow up and provide guidance to schools and um, especially if they're seeing those high case rates within school buildings and the um, outbreak status within buildings. However, at this time, there's still nothing uh, punitive towards schools if they do not follow the guidance. Okay. Thanks. Anything else, uh, Director Bennett? Your hand's still. Oh, no, I can lower that. I got more <laughs> questions, but we, we can move on. <laughs> well, are there any other questions about this part of the presentation? Director Beebe. Um, since Director Bennett um, spoke of these other private parochial schools um, that may not be following the guidelines, um, do you have any information, Dr. Kelly, on cases um, within private schools in our community that give us some insight on, you know, how is it spreading? Uh, Chair Corman, uh, sorry, I can't see it, Director Beebe. Oh, um, we, we do have some insight. Uh, so the, the slide that I shared with you about cases by age group, reflects cases for every resident of Bloomington in those age groups. So that would include any residents in Bloomington attending a private or a charter or homeschooled. Um, okay. One of the things that we, we also see when we're digging into the data a bit more is uh, when the interviews are done, and these interviews, uh, uh, Hannah was, was kind on the amount of time they spend the they spend typically over an hour and then somebody from the state or our office is spending an additional hour with these families and we're getting a, a lot of information. One of the questions is asked uh, about what school they attended. Mm -hmm. And so we can see that data. Um, we, we do see cases associated with uh, almost every school, um, whether it's public, charter or private in Bloomington. Okay. Private schools, based on the governor's order, are, are not required to follow the state guidelines. Um, they're strongly encouraged, and that's what we recommend they do. Uh, but as a, as a private school, they're not bound by the executive order to do that. And we have seen uh, cases in private schools, and we have seen uh, fairly large case rates in some other jurisdictions with private schools that way. Okay. Thank you very much. Director Olson. Um, I'd like us to take into consideration too that with the family gatherings, if you know, if the community isn't 100% on board, there will be fa family gatherings coming up for the holidays too. And um, I can only imagine that's going to increase rates. And I have heard of schools that are taking off they're taking vacation Thanksgiving right through all the holidays until January. Okay, any other questions before we continue with the presentation? Oh, Director Bennett, sorry. Yeah, just to be clear, I wasn't referring to private or parochial schools. I was referring to other public school districts. So did, did I state that incorrectly? <laughs> or is that what you heard me say, Ms. Hatch? No, that's what I heard you say, and okay. I understand your confusion and frustration around it. I think we've dealt with the same thing on our end too. That uh, all along we've we've stuck with our guidelines that we want to follow the state's guidance and make decisions based off of data and off of um, the guidance given to us by the state and by Bloomington Public Health. And unfortunately, we can't force other districts to do the same. But we are aware that everyone is interpreting that differently, and um, and making decisions differently than our district is as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If there are no any other questions about this part of the presentation, then we'll continue with uh, Superintendent Pizitaki. Thank you. Back on the screen. Uh, okay. Uh, first, I want to respond to Director Bennett's question about the inconsistencies between school districts and the comparison, people asking why does that school district do this and we do that. We have been very consistent from the very beginning of following state guidelines and following the guidance of the public health department and our nursing supervisor 
and our other healthcare professionals that we consult with. We feel that's critical because it's about health and safety. And so that's been our practice. I can't speak for why other districts do what they do. We've asked the state why, and the state just reports back to us. That's, they, that's what they're doing. And there's nothing the state can do or has done with those districts. So we just stay true to our, our practice, our protocols, and we, and that's what we're basing our recommendations to you on tonight. Okay, having said all that, I wanna thank Dr. Kelly again and Ms. Hatch. They're, they work, they're great to work with and they're a great team. Now what you're seeing on, can you move to the next slide, please? Great, thank you. This is, is a new chart titled Programming Calendar. This chart is formatted to show our recommendations that respond to the new COVID conditions that was shared by Dr. Kelly and Ms. Hatch. At the top of the chart, there are two horizontal blue bars, and these are title bars. Please focus on the three rows immediately below those two blue bars. These three rows represent our elementary school recommendations. I'll now ask Dr. Mitchler and our Executive Director of Special Education, Jennifer McIntyre, to present and explain our recommendations for elementary schools. Dr. Mitchler, Ms. Hatch, please. Thank you, Superintendent Fujitaki. Yeah, so I'll start with that first line directly under where it says schools and programs. So elementary, as you heard in the presentation tonight, the recommendation we're putting forward is to move to distance learning with the last day of hybrid being no later than November 20th. And so this recommendation comes from uh, conversations and feedback that we've gather gathered um, from folks in the district, leaders in the district, um, and so we're trying to take into consideration, we want to be planful because we know that families will need some time to adjust to any changes. We know staff will need some time to prepare to, to any adjustments or changes. And so that's why you see this date of November 20th. The recommendation for how long then, if we were to shift on that um, after that date to distance learning, that we would stay in distance learning is through that first week in January. And that's where at that point we would reevaluate our data and our programming and see if it would be feasible for us to perhaps move back into a, a hybrid model. Just a couple of other notes about this recommendation. So what we're also recommending is that there would be uh, no classes on Monday and Tuesday, the 23rd and 24th. Um, perhaps students may have some activities they could engage in if they, if they chose to. Um, and then the 25th, of, of, of course, is um, right now set to be a, a conference comp day. So there are either some conferences that would be taking place that day or um, some of our teachers have some comp time. So what this would provide is two days, the 23rd and the 24th, for staff to prepare for this shift to then after we come back from a little bit of a break, the second half of that week, to, to start in with distance learning then um, right away on that following Monday. And so I um, wanted to share this information with you. Um, also just recognize in the note section there, it mentions that the transition to distance learning, from distance learning to hybrid, we would need to look at about a month's worth of data before we could come back and um, really look at making any changes to, to that model shift. So um, with that, I will then hand it over to Executive Director of Student Services, um, Jennifer McIntyre, who will talk a little bit about elementary supports. Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Dr. Mitchler. Um, I will briefly just talk about what elementary supports um, would look like, particularly within special education. As we know, in the most recent executive summary that came out at the end of last week, there's an emphasis looking at our students who have some of the highest needs, particularly students who have disabilities or students who have higher needs in, in other areas outside of special education. And we've been looking at um, how do we provide those services? We have built out systems in place already throughout the fall of this school year in identifying students, what areas of need do they have? What areas of need do they have specific to special education in their areas of disability? And at what level would we provide face-to-face -face or supports um, by coming into the school, into the school um, environment? We will continue to do that if, if we move into this uh, model of distance learning and we'll continue to identify those students as well as identify how we will provide those supports um, and direct instruction to those students. 
typically our students who are of our highest needs who are distance learning and in remote um, access is not something that's accessible to them. So we will specifically look at that and work with our each of our building teams and identifying students. With that, I'll pass it back to Dr. Mitchler for the next area. Thank you for that. Um, so then the other areas you see here, that third bar is elementary after school programming. So admittedly, there's not a lot of um, elementary after school programming that's taking place outside of what you'll hear later on with regard to what's happening in um, community ed. So with Kids Safari, that type of programming. Um, but where we do have a few things happening here or there, uh, I just wanna note that those things as well, we would look at um, making a shift no later than November 20th, just as we would with the rest of the elementary model, and then again, reevaluating that first week in January. So with that, uh, I will hand it back to Superintendent Fujitaki. Great, thank you very much. Chair Corman, um, the team is ready for questions regarding our elementary recommendations. Thank you, uh, Superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Mitchler. Um, and thank you, uh, Mrs. McIntyre. McIntyre. Okay, any questions? I see hands. Uh, let's go with Director Starks. Um, so my question is, and actually I haven't even checked to see if there's any elementary principals on this call. So it may be an elementary principal or someone else that wants to answer this, but um, uh, I know, you know, in the recommendations that there's this two week window of, of, um, of ramping down from hybrid into distance learning, but I'm curious from, uh, uh, perspective from the elementary schools, what things are you most concerned about, about making this shift um, and in the time frame that uh, is proposed? Yeah, thanks for that question, Director Starks. I can take that. I um, have been meeting with the elementary principals regularly. We had a me meeting just later this afternoon to talk about this as well as what concerns would we have if, if we were to move forward or the board were to move forward with this recommendation. Um, we talked a little bit about how in the last shift where we moved from distance learning to hybrid, we needed a little bit more time specifically around some of our uh, adjustments in the technology side of things because we know that some of our students were reassigned new teachers, for example, some of the class lists shifted a little bit. Uh, in this case, if we were to make the shift from distance learning, I'm sorry, from hybrid to distance learning, um, we would be, as we've said before, trying to keep and really keeping the students with their current teachers. So we would not see the level of movement that we saw last time. And that would really make it so that we wouldn't, it wouldn't be necessary for us to take quite as much time to make a shift um, because of our, the tech side of things. So that's one, one change I would note. Um, another thing that I've also heard the principals mention is just to make sure that um, both families and staff are prepared for the shift. And so on the family side of things, we want to make sure people have an opportunity to um, prepare for, you know, child care needs, for example, um, get ready for that, what that shift looks like for their, their unique household. And then for staff to just have those couple of days to prepare. And again, the, the two days is what we'd be looking at if we could be planful enough to pick a date, um, if that's what this group decided to do. Thank you. Director Bibi. Mm -hmm. um, this would be directed to Jennifer McIntyre. Um, and I know you've really been struggling to work on what is the best solution for those special needs students. And um, I was asked by a, a, a para today who works with the Sun students, but also was very concerned for the Thrive students. Will they be just students out of those groups, or will it maybe be focused on one group um, to come into the school? And, you know, just really concerned about some of the parents who, um, who this para works with that are very emotionally drained um, at this time and wondering what to do. And I, I was actually really encouraged just to hear how you want parents to be prepared as well as teachers. Um, I think we just have to be so compassionate to families and the struggles that they're facing, as well as our teachers um, and the shifts that they've made. Um, and I, I have to say, this is the most difficult time of teaching they've ever faced. And so I think compassion is the greatest thing, but I, I am wanting to make sure these kids don't fall through the cracks, as I know your heart also doesn't want them to either. 
Thank you, Director Beebe, um, and thank you for that question. And, and also the, the thoughtfulness of our families and wanting to be compassionate. It is, it's been a big ask for us this year to be in distance learning and, and working with our students at the level that we're able to. Um, we will continue to identify the students, particularly their students who receive the majority of their day within special education is where we will, we have been um, identifying students through, since, the, since the fall of the year and bringing students in to receive services. Um, parts of the week. It's not been at, of course, the level we would project to be, but we want to keep everybody safe in that um, to include our, our students and our, our staff along with that, while still being able to provide some of that direct instruction face to face with our students. Wanting to keep those group sizes small and wanting to keep that um, interaction in shorter periods of time, we really have had to focus on our students that have some of the highest needs. So some of the students who you have identified, we've been spe really specifically looking at how do we um, manage and provide those services to the students and, and what makes sense as far as um, identifying the needs and then bringing students into schools um, to make sure that we have everything set up both for the students and for the, um, the staff who are providing those services. We also have worked really closely with our transportation department and our, our building administrators to ensure that within our buildings, we're able to provide um, as much structure as we can as we're, um, who are providing those services. Thank you so much for everything you do. Yes, thank you. Director Sorum. Thank you. So. The last day of school will be on November 20th. And then they come back on December 1st. No, the 30th. They come back on the 30th for another three weeks of school before they go on a winter break. Um, and I realize the, the main consideration is the rise in the COVID rate. Um, rather, you know, and that's probably the primary focus of, of doing this. But so far they've been, they started out with distance learning, then they went to hybrid, and now they're going to go back to distance learning again for another three weeks, then after January. So the analysis is going to be what the reevaluation of the model. So we might go back to hybrid after January 1st again, so we're distance learning hybrid, distance learning hybrid, um, has to take a toll on the families and staff in order to do this. And I, and I recognize and appreciate all the efforts that the teams have put in to come up with the 20th as the uh, end date rather than wait till December 18th at the end of the, uh, before the winter break. So, and I, and I guess that's, that's what we'll hear more from the governor about, you know, whether he's gonna actually <clears throat> direct us to shut down certain things or go back to whatever. But it just seems that the students just got used to their teachers and going to hybrid and now they're gonna go back to distance learning again. Um, so I guess I need some reassurance that the best thing to do is to do it this way. And I realize also that the middle school and middle schools and high schools are gonna stay in distance learning and they're gonna be re-evaluated after the first of the year because I know I still get a lot of emails from the parents, various sporting teams and various students in middle school and high school that say, <clears throat> wait a minute, why can't we go to hybrid one day a week or whatever, all those different options. So who wants to take that? Uh, I will, Director Sorum. What kind of reassurance are you looking for? I guess that the, that the spike going up to 60. <clears throat> I know there's been some that says Hennepin County is at 68. And, um, and you know, and this is another game of the scientists versus scientists. And, um, but it's just that how, how will we know, does the governor have any kind of magic plan that's all of a sudden going to drop it down to 40 again? Well, I'll call upon Dr. Kelly to say what, what he can project. I don't know if he can tell you whether it's going to be 60 or 50. Dr. Kelly? Uh, thank you. Um, one of the, the challenges we have with uh, <clears throat> infectious diseases is uh, they, they also, in some ways, behave like 
other things in our natural world. So just like if you throw a, a ball in the air, gravity is going to make it fall. We know cases are going to rise and they will go down. The exact trajectory of what's going to happen over the next couple of months is really dependent upon how the state of Minnesota, uh, the metro region, and our fellow neighbors in Bloomington act. So the, the governor has some tools. Um, he's indicated that he's willing to look at more of a, a surgical approach to a lockdown um, or a, a dial back. That will help. Uh, we also uh, have some community events that are gonna be happening with uh, Thanksgiving and, and holidays. And we've seen spikes in cases associated with holidays in Minnesota over the last eight months. And so it's going to be a rocky road. It's going to go up. It will come back down. Um, you can't maintain uh, such a high case rate uh, for a long duration um, without having some other substantial change. And so I, I'm confident as it goes up, it'll come back down. Uh, I can't tell you it's going to come back down to this case rate by this day in December or January. Uh, but I think it's it's very realistic to be looking at a January time frame to reevaluate, knowing we're likely going to be heading in a in a, a positive direction in that time frame that will allow us to do some additional planning for how to provide more in-person learning to our students. Thank you. Um, Director Starks. Um, so I have two items. One, can I respond um, to Director Sorum? So I, this is probably isn't reassurance either, Director Sorum, but um, whoever's pre whoever's presenting right now, it's like a, it's a line graph that kind of shows the rate, the trend of, of uh, cases, because I want to just share with Director Sorum and other folks that one. Thank you. So, um, I've always been a very big stickler when we've been making these decisions on what is the number that's coming from the state about Hennepin County cases, right? So right now that's 34 and, and Director Bennett brought this up earlier too. And so, um, you know, if we were in a, a situation where the graph was what it looked like between like o July and October and our numbers were 31, I'd have a really tough time with the administration's suggestion to go to distance learning because we weren't seeing, and I wasn't being assured that we were seeing anything that would give any indication of where we're gonna go. And if you remember in August, I think when we made our first decision to go to hybrid, it was like in the twenties, then it dipped down into the teens, then it went back up to the twenties and we went down into the teens. Now we went from teens to twenties to thirties in three weeks. And we're hearing that we're probably gonna go close to 50, if not 50 by Thursday. So for me, that graph is what's changing my um, ability to go above what the Hennepin County numbers are right now. I, so I don't know, Director Storm, if that helps at all, but that's just my thinking. I just wanted to share that. Um, and then my other question is, okay, so I'm sorry, Dr. Mitchler. Now, can you go back to the slide that we were at before? My apologies. Um, there's a phrasing in there that's being used that says no later than November 20th. And I heard um, Ms. Hatch mention this too, um, that you know, we're hoping to make it to the 20th. So my question is, what concerns are, are you having that you're phrasing it no later than the 20th? And would we be looking at uh, having to close the district as a whole, or would we be in a position where we're either closing classrooms or buildings independently instead of a, a full district um, if, if we had to go earlier than the 20th? Director, uh, Director Starks, it's because of operational challenges such as substitutes, getting enough substitutes, staff falling ill and taking absences, just having enough staff to run our operations. And right now we're, we're experiencing those challenges. If we receive a spike where we have to quarantine or people have to stay, take time off for illnesses, we may not be able to keep operations going. And that's why we say no later than November 20th. 
So if you saw one, I'm sorry, can I do a follow up? Yes, sure. <laughs> if you saw one school that you're seeing the uh, big problems with, would you be willing to close just one school or are you going to be doing an all or nothing for the elementaries? The short the answer is we would do what they're calling scalpel approach or surgical approach and just target certain schools. And that's what we do. We've never done that before, but we'd have to do it in those cases. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Director Olson, your hand is up. I don't know if you meant to have it up, but um, <laughs> if we did. Thank you, I did. But it, it's been a while, so I'm kind of going back um, to something. Uh, I just wanted to mention when we were talking about special ed that um, in Gov Governor Waltz's phone call to the American School Boards Association, uh, he did <clears throat> mention that no matter what learning model we are in, I want to reassure people out there um, that there would be, they would prioritize students who are disproportionately affected by um, distance learning and they, you know, with in-person services. And that would include not just children in special ed, but, um, you know, students with housing instability or students in foster care, um, students who have aged out of services could continue services. Um, so I just wanted to reassure the public that they are looking at in-person services for um, students who are disproportionately affected. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Superintendent, please continue. Your microphone. So that concludes the questions for elementary. We'll move on to middle schools then. Uh, after the three middle elementary bars, there are three following bars on the chart. Those are for the middle school recommendations. I'll call upon Valley View Middle School Principal Megan Wolrit and Executive Director McIntyre to present, explain our recommendations for our middle schools. Um, Ms. Wolrit, please. Good morning, everybody. My name is Megan Wolrit. I'm the principal at Valley View Middle School. Um, sorry, I had to join with my phone, so I hope that you can hear me okay. Um, as everyone's being asked to make switches and changes and pivots um, during this time, uh, the middle schools are also being asked to make changes. Uh, we have developed a number of in-person supports for our students um, that were robust and would bring in a number of kids um, during that Wednesday um, office hours day. Uh, we are now relooking at those uh, targeted, those services that would be happening, those supports that would be happening on those Wednesdays. And we will be um, developing guidelines to bring in a limited, very limited number of students per the MDH guidelines. Um, and so we are also relooking at our supports um, to ensure that we are maintaining the safety guidelines that have been um, placed upon us. Um, this is uh, Jennifer McIntyre, Executive Director of Student Services. And um, similar to what I had reported for our elementary, um, looking at our middle school programming um, with the additional supports that Principal Willert had just discussed, we'd also added in additional services for students um, for face-to-face -face, uh, within special education and some of our other support areas. Um, we had started to increase um, those services and have discussions around how to increase those services with the um, change now and, and needing to look at uh, the higher case rates and looking at distance learning, there we will continue to forge forward and, and look at which of our students similar to elementary do we need to bring in and have face-to-face -face services provided for them and which of our students would we continue with our distance and remote learning opportunities. Um, similar process where we have problem solving teams who walk right through that and then also identification of the um, staff to support those students in our buildings. So we will continue with that process. There'll be small groups of students and small numbers of students that we'll look at to start. And then um, for the time, and we'll continue to build those supports as we, as we move forward. Thank you very much. That, that ex those are explanations for our middle school recommendations. Chair Corman, the team is ready for, to respond to questions. Questions on the middle school recommendations. Director Olson. I'm sorry, I didn't know my hand was still up, but as long as it is, I just, um, yes, I, I agree with remaining in distance learning. I've had communications with uh, 
parents in other districts who are in hybrid with their middle schoolers and they have said that their students prefer the distance learning because they are really uncomfortable with being in person and having all these restrictions. It is feels more like a prison sentence or a prison. restrictions. So I just wanted to add that since I had my hand up accidentally. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anybody else? Should we move into? Let's continue, Superintendent. Okay, thank you very much. The next um, bars are for the high school recommendations that I'll call on Dr. Anderson, Jefferson High School principal, and Kenny High School principal. Awesome, awesome. Jason, please. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, uh, Chair Corman, members of the school board, Superintendent Fujitaki. As you can see, our recommendation to continue working in distance learning, but uh, just want to share with uh, the board and the uh, viewing public that we have uh, been evaluating uh, consistently our success uh, and strengths during distance learning trimester one and, and uh, are planning uh, to continue to evolve our programming uh, into try two. So we're going to take um, our learnings and our research and continue to adapt and evolve for trimester two um, to, to um, even greater success we are planning. Uh, as far as supports goes, yes, we are, both high schools have been bringing in small numbers of students for folks and intentional supports, um, but we are um, uh, certainly ready and willing to adapt as needed to, to other data. But uh, both high schools for several weeks now um, have been doing uh, in-person supports as well as dis distance learning supports. And that is something that our teams have been working um, very hard on is how to um, craft, monitor, and implement uh, supports uh, via distance learning, which is certainly a, a new venture, but uh, our teams are working really, uh, really, really dil diligently at that. There's not much I could add, except that we're collaborating <laughs> and working closely <laughs> together. Um, is that Director McIntyre, do you have anything to add to that as far as supports? Um, you know, working with both uh, both of the high school principals for students, um, we have strong teams in place making those decisions and, and starting to really get those supports in place. So um, I, I don't have anything beyond that to add. Okay, okay thank you. Chair Corman, the team's ready for questions. Thank you. Questions for members? Director Beebe. Um, looking at the date, um, when we would reconsider. We said we'd look in the first week of January. Since COVID has a two-week or 14-day um, incubation period, and is that going to be enough time um, following holidays where people may not be respecting the time um, of isolation to prevent the spread? Paula, Dr. Kelly, could you help, please? Chair Corman, uh, Director Beebe, um, that I think the the approach the district is taking is we're going to continuously look at this process. So that gives us the first window of are we starting down a, a positive trajectory. So you're correct. We we do have that 14 day incubation period, but uh, the first week of January, that, that four full week of data, we'll have some good indication of uh, what happened post Christmas. Um, we may not have the full magnitude of what happened post New Year's, uh, but it will help us get an idea of what direction we're going to be heading into January um, and help us think about how we're going to be planning the next several weeks. Director Stacks. Um, so I also want to respond to Director Beebe's question because I had that same question when I was looking at the dates. Um, the other factor that I was looking at is middle school starts their third quarter on January 20th. So if we're able to look at data at that first week in January, there's who knows, right? But if the numbers are going down far enough, we may be able to make a model change that is right at the at the point where middle school students would be starting new classes. So that was the other reason I thought it's probably a good idea to at least evaluate at that point, because if we can, 
that's better than than waiting too long and then having those middle school students start you know two weeks in distance learning and then moving to hybrid depending on covid numbers but that was another factor i considered any other questions director olson I wanted to make sure to ask um, about the equity of the um, internet reliability for our students. Well, for example, EL students, this will be for John Weisner. Uh, Director Olson, we, um, so we, we monitor internet access uh, in the form of, uh, do we have enough supply of our main, our main form of internet, providing internet access to fill this gap is these Wi-Fi hotspots. It's a common strategy across uh, districts. So again, we're not unique in this way. The way we monitor that to get to the core of your question is uh, our availability. And uh, we, through the tech center at uh, Kennedy High School, we have, I think I saw the number this morning of like 40 hotspots uh, available. And then we look, we do a second form of monitoring, which is we look at the data usage by the hotspots that are uh, distributed. And that data usage is well below our district cap. We pay by a certain amount of data usage. Uh, if we approach that data cap, then the providers start to restrict our bandwidth. And, and both of those, in both of those measures, we're doing great in terms of internet access. That being said, I don't want to say those hotspots are are like the be all and end all. It is a sustenance level of Wi-Fi, and so um, we're we're also partnering with Education Foundation to help families that qualify move off of that hotspot temporary solution onto Comcast Internet Essentials. Uh, that process. I'll say has a, has a number of twists and turns in it. And so it's not the, the easiest process to navigate, but we are working with EFB to uh, get as many families over to that stable internet source as possible. Okay, thank you. And we have certainly received a few emails with concerns in regards to this, um, you know, students, uh, uh, being able to connect and to have a safe connection. And, you know, as I look into that, um, even, even our students whose families mm -hmm. have a um, possibility of having internet connection through a provider um, seem to be struggling with those connections as well. So it seems like it's, you know, it's, it's a good point of um, that that maybe we should continue to bring to the state as well uh, when it comes to um, internet service for all families. So thank you for bringing that up, uh, Director Olson. And um, I'm you know I'm positive, and I, I trust that we will continue to work with our uh, technology department and continue to provide um, what our students need. So thank you. Um, okay, any other questions, Director Starks? No? <laughs> okay, just a hand up. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, the other board members, I cannot see my screen, so I'm not sure. So I just want to make sure maybe Director Bennett or Director Sorum. I don't see you on my screen right now, so I'm not sure. So please feel free to ask if, if you have a question. I don't hear any. Director Olson, did you have an extra question there? Um, I'm just wondering when we reevaluate in January, do we, um, would we consider waiting until a certain time in the trimester or is there the possibility that we would ever start back in hybrid in the middle of a trimester? I think some teachers have concerns about that. Dr. Anderson, could you handle that please? Sure. Uh, you know, like we discussed in during uh, the fall, we could make a shift at any time that the board so chooses, uh, but it is significantly uh, cleaner from a systems perspective to do it at a trimester for multiple reasons that I could certainly go down uh, at, at, a, at your discretion. But so we could 
but uh, uh, much cleaner, simpler, and more effective at a trimester change. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, for those families who might be wondering if, you know, as we are, we're talking about um, last day, no later than November 20th. So we're talking about November 20th, but if there are families who probably choose to be or um, to stay in the distance or to keep their kids on distance learning, is that a possibility or not until the 20th? or before the 20th, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Could you, could you repeat the question? Chair yeah, Cormier? okay, so for those families who have a concern of um, maybe continuing to send their kids to school in the hybrid model, um, and we're looking at November 20th now, is it possible for families in distance learning or not because of staffing? There's no problem with with parents keeping their children in distance learning right now. We have sufficient staff to handle it. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to make sure just in case somebody is wondering, you know, what if I don't feel comfortable uh, about sending my kid to school in the next couple oh, for the next so couple of weeks, can I keep my kid at home instead? So in other words, instead of being a hybrid, they're currently in hybrid, they want to transition to distance learning now. Correct. I believe we we can take the we have capacity to absorb those children. Okay, um, Dr. Dr. Mister, do you agree? Yes, we're working with families who, um, if if there is a family that believes that they really do need to make the shift sooner than what the board would decide to make the shift, uh, we would work with the family to meet their needs. But would that work for our teachers, though? You know, I think we want to do what's um, best for the families and the students and um, and and work with our staffing as best as possible. Uh, the state guidance helps us too to know that we need to prioritize if a family wishes to move from hybrid to distance learning. So we would continue to follow that guidance and work with the family um, if they if there was a decision from the board and the family wanted to do something different. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, Superintendent, please continue. Okay, great. I'll call on Executive Director Jake Winchell. He's uh, in charge of community education to cover the next three community ed programs. Jake, please. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Fujitaki. Good evening, board members, Chair Farman. Um, my name is Jake Winchell, I'm Executive Director of Community Education. And like Superintendent just mentioned, I'll handle the next three topics. Um, and so I'll just run through them and you'll have time to ask questions there at the end. So. Um, early childhood, which includes our preschool and ECFE programs, um, would follow the model that the K through five programs um, moved to, much like we did back to last spring. As a P to P5 system, we feel it mirroring the same system that the K through five system is in um, is important. A reminder that we've uh, we're in distance learning this fall, so our teachers are familiar with it, um, and we'll be able to make that shift. Um, Childcare, very quickly, um, we're looking at scaling back childcare to the tier one families, um, the tier one professions. Right now, we're open to tier one and beyond. Um, currently, we have 110 children registered that are tier one families. Um, doing this back to just tier one, we'd be able to consolidate to just one or two sites, um, as opposed to the three that we're currently operating in. Um, there would be some families that would potentially be out of childcare if that, if that was the case. Um, and then facility rentals, we were very fortunate dating back to last summer that we were able to run some facility rentals. Mike Larson and his team did a very, very, very nice job getting um, those COVID-19 plans up and the buildings up and running. However, with the cases rising the way they are and the fact that a lot of our events bring in families and people from all over the state, well beyond just Bloomington and Hennepin County, um, we feel that also facility rentals should be halted um, no later than November 20th. Other community education programs such as aquatics, youth and adult enrichment would either be halted or move to virtual classes as well. That's my report. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Superintendent Christine. All right, Chair Corman, we're ready for questions. Questions, board members. I don't think we have any. 
correct? I, there's a couple of board members that I cannot see on the screen. So one director. Yeah, I had a question. Okay, Director Bennett, thank you. Um, yeah, so when it comes to um, the rentals, does that mean that like a BAA that rents a uh, gym space or Barracuda Club that rents pools, so those will all be canceled after November 20th? Correct. Yep. And this looking at the currently that is the plan that we would halt all rentals to kind of limit the amount of traffic in the buildings. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Director Bibi. Um, would any of those uh, special ed kids that are in your early childhood program be receiving receiving services um, uh, brought in on Wednesdays or other days? Um, I know some families that are very concerned about that. Director Beebe, that is an excellent question. And uh, Director, Executive Director McIntyre, if I can lean on you to help answer that question, I would appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Executive Director Winchell. I appreciate it. Um, we have been working closely uh, with our child care services to provide some of, some of the um, uh, distance learning instruction um, in child care. And we would continue to look at that to balance out our abilities to do that um and continue to work closely together in, in when can we provide that and what makes the most sense for the students who are in our child care setting um and then also being able to look at what is the level of need for those students if they are needing it in a face-to-face -face model or if remote or just in a, a remote or distance learning manner we um would work for those students that are in our child care settings and we've also worked closely with some of our uh, additional supports through our paraprofessional uh, uh, group and then also some of our other supports with our child care. Um, um, would that also include those in the early childhood program? Director Beebe, if I can just rephrase your question, are you asking, are we providing special education services to students who are in our child care program who also receive, um, no, okay. The early child, early childhood. So, um, you know, those that are in preschool, but receive special ed services over at Pond. So Director Beebe, if I can ask one more time, if. If you are asking, are we continuing to provide the services to our students who are in our early childhood program once we move into a distance learning model? Yes, yes. Okay, okay thank you. I just want to make sure I was answering the right, the right question. Yes. Um, yes, we would continue to provide those services and, and we would continue to look at how how to meet those needs we had suspended and we have been not we have not been doing any of our home visits which we traditionally do in our birth to three model for early childhood um, we did start with our hybrid model with elementary to bring in our preschool um, our preschool four-year-old programs into um, our school settings to provide those services and with this shift we would shift back to distance learning with remote learning or remote education being our primary mode to provide those services um, and also to look at some of our students who are more significantly impacted, would we bring them in for face-to-face -face services um, and do the same uh, model and same process uh, that we would do for our elementary, middle school, and high school age students. Um, our early childhood special education leadership and team um, have been working really closely together with uh, uh, Jake's team um, to consider what are the students that, or which of our students would we bring in to provide that face-to-face -face and for what length of time, again, we're working with our transportation and then administration in each of those buildings to provide those services. So yes, we would have that additional conversation with our early child special education. Thank you, Director Beebe. Yeah, thank you. That does answer my question. So thank you. Thank you. Other questions, Director Olson? Okay, I am really sorry, but I have to go back to elementary school because I remembered that some some of the classes have begun, begun map testing. And I'm wondering if we're going to have um, such a short period of hybrid, is that going to still be a priority when there's so little face-to-face -face time left? And also if they started it, how would they complete it? And can we just not have that be a priority right now? This is Dave Feist, the director of research and um, we we have started doing testing this week um, and um, 
And for those students that have tested already, the parents will get reports on how the student is going, doing in terms of percentile ranks uh, compared to national norms, et cetera. Um, I have a meeting with the assessment committee set up for Wednesday, uh, where we plan to discuss uh, contingency plans. I also have a meeting with the uh, elementary principals coming up on Thursday. And so um, I will need the help of my colleagues to, to make that decision, whether we wanna discontinue testing right now or leave it up to schools to decide the, co the benefits of getting the, the test scores versus the, the instructional time. So it's an excellent question um, and uh, we'll work to get you an answer as soon as possible. Thank you. And I'm hoping that there can be teacher input on that as well. Thank you. Any other questions on early childhood before we continue? Doesn't seem like it. Okay, superintendent, please. Great, thank you. The next topic is athletic and activities. I have, um, we have Kennedy High School Activities Director John Anderson with us. But before Uh, now, Executive Director of Community uh, Relations, Rick Kaufman, has a comment about activities and learning. Rick? Thank you, Superintendent Fujitaki. Um, so, as you all know, we've been not only looking at data, as uh, Hannah Hatch mentioned earlier, the staffing. Um, we also look at other school districts in the metro area, including our neighboring districts, to see what they're doing with respect to the various different learning models, and in this case, athletics and activities. And um, as you can imagine, um, this is a this area is very very difficult for schools, because as students have come back to school and those uh, secondary schools where students remain in distance learning, they've been allowed to participate in athletics and activities, including uh, uh, plays and drama and show choir and band and things of that nature. Um, it has provided a release for those students, um, no doubt um, that they would not have had if, had we remained in distance learning. With the conversation tonight about uh, shifting to distance learning um, for the elementary schools or, and remaining in such with the high schools, it does put complexity into that decision making with respect to activities and athletics. What we are finding is a mixed bag of schools in the metro area with when it comes to athletics and activities. And some are at this point even though they're in distance learning or shifting to distance learning, will continue with athletics and activities, at least um, some, uh, uh, some indicating to do so while they can operate as safely as possible. What that specifically means, we don't know. And we also know that MSHSL um, has not come out with a final recommendation um, on this matter. So I wanted to put that out there. And I know uh, Mr. Anderson is joining us tonight uh, from from Kennedy to weigh in on this as well, but I just I had asked Les for opportunity to share with you the complexity, but also what we're seeing in other districts with respect to athletics and activities. Great, thank you, Rick. John, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for allowing me the time to speak today. Um, the guidelines by the Minnesota Department of Education and the Minnesota State High School Leagues is that when a school is put into distance learning uh, or makes the, looks at the metrics and the metrics decide that they should be in distance learning, then those athletics and activities programs should shift then into what we call virtual coaching, which means there would be no in-person contact between uh, the advisors or the coaches uh, for practices and or competitions. Um, now, obviously, you know, this is an issue for our, our sports that are currently going on. Uh, football uh, has one more game in their regular season. Um, I believe Jefferson plays on Wednesday and Candy plays on Thursday. They both start playoffs on Tuesday the 17th. Uh, volleyball, uh, they have one more week of their regular season after November 20th. Uh, with playoffs to be the two weeks following that, the last week of November. 
uh, starting on the 30th and then the following week in December. Uh, for our winter sports, uh, they are just starting off. Uh, in fact, dance, our dance team uh, started today. Uh, they were the very first ones to start today. This week is a, a chore uh, uh, choreography week where they learn uh, uh, the dance and then next week where they start having tryouts. On the 23rd of November, uh, boys hockey was scheduled to start. Boys basketball was scheduled to start. On the 30th of November, uh, boys swim and dive, uh, Nordic and alpine ski, wrestling, and girls hockey were all slated to start. On December 7th, uh, girls gymnastics and girls basketball were both slated to start. Uh, and our adapted floor hockey teams, in, in talking with those coaches, they had planned to start after the new year. Um, you know, we follow the recommendations by the Minnesota Department of Education and the Minnesota State High School League uh, that call for us to make this shift in what we're doing in athletics um, and activities. Um, you know, besides those athletics, you know, I, I should mention also our both school show choirs are going. Uh, both schools have jazz band currently going, and there are other activities as well, which are currently going, which can make the shift to that virtual model. Um, you know, and this is not great. Obviously, no one wants to be in this situation. Uh, the whole thing is, is everyone wishes this would just go away or wouldn't have happened. Um, but unfortunately, this is uh, what we're in, and this is what we're dealing with right now. You know, and we listen to the experts. You know, we listen to those people uh, who, who this is what they do for a living, like Dr. Kelly and, and Hannah Hatch. Um, you know, I, I coached football for 18 years. And one of the major issues we always had to deal with when I was a football coach was concussions. And I was never the one to make the decision about a student athlete of mine going back in the practice or going back on the field about concussions. I let the qualified medical experts make that decision, make that call. Uh, and, and this is really what we're doing with, with this situation as well. We're, we're leaning on the qualified medical experts and Dr. Kelly and Hannah Hatch uh, to make this call and following the recommendations from the Minnesota Department of Education and the Minnesota State High School League. Back to you, Les. Okay, great. Thank you, Chair Corman. We're ready for questions. Questions. Director starts. Oh, I have a lot of questions. So I'll start with one. <laughs> um, so, uh, Mr. Anderson, can you talk a little bit about, nope, I'm going to start with something. So my frustration with the decision about athletics and activities being put in the laps of districts by district is that it, there seems to be no coordination amongst conferences or there seems to be no uh, universal guidance coming from the Minnesota State High School League. And I, I recognize that the Minnesota State High School League this fall got into a lot of hot water about how they made decisions about football and volleyball that were reversed later in the in the year. Um, but it, I, would there be, is there the ability to have conversations at a conference level instead of a district by district level? Um, or have you seen any um, hints that the Minnesota State High School League may take a similar approach that they did this fall where they green lighted certain sports and, and red lighted others? Uh, the Minnesota State High School League has given no indication that they have any desire whatsoever to make a decision like that again like they had to do this spring um they they have no desire they they still regret it feels like uh that they made that decision so i, I don't imagine they'll uh step in and postpone anything as for a conference to conference i i have heard no discussion amongst our conference the metro west conference uh nor have i heard any other discussion amongst any other ad's that conferences would consider doing um the same thing together um no one really wants to to be forced into lockstep if they don't have to be so okay thank you director bennett yes uh 
<clears throat> Mr. Anderson, thanks for uh, your information so far. Um, so, so far with sports that have happened in the fall, have we been seeing any type of outbreaks at all? Have we had any positive cases or anything that are linked to any sporting events or, or practices that you know of, either at Kennedy or Jefferson? Uh, I cannot speak to the exact details of any outbreaks related to uh, what's gone on at, at Jefferson. Um, we have had to shut down one of our programs uh, because of uh, positive uh, test results um, and through the contact tracing and consultation with, with Hannah and, uh, and, and her department and how they do that, you know, we made the decision to shut down one of our programs currently going on right now. They're in the 14 day quarantine. Uh, I do know Jefferson has had some programs as well this fall that have also had to shut down for a period of time. Um, but, you know, that's the best we can say. Ms. Ash, could you share information about Jefferson High School programming, please? Sure, yes. Uh, I, just like uh, John Anderson stated, we can't share specific details of any cases. However, I can share with you that we have seen outbreaks and cases within our sporting events um, throughout the district, including Jefferson and Kennedy High School. Uh, just like at Kennedy, we have had to shut down one program to be quarantined at Jefferson fully and then have had um, several other programs have multiple people go out due to positive cases as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else before we go back to Director Starks? No, Director Stark. All right, question number two. This is more of a statement, but um, another one of my concerns is uh, club sports. So, uh, you know, the, the um, burden of whether or not high school sports or middle school activities uh, runs is, is put on the district. Um, but then uh, is there any uh, community, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, okay, it seems like a double standard that we have to close down activities that are sponsored by a school district when then the club ec equivalent of that program can still run fully functional. So if, uh, is somebody willing to talk about that contradiction? I'll do the best I, I can with that. Uh, uh, board member Starks, the we only have control of our own high school programs. Uh, we have no control, no say over the club programs. There's no statewide agency that is a governing body over the club and travel programs. Um, some have, you know, uh, various groups that, that lead them, but in terms of a total package, there, there's nothing that controls those. Um, so we can't stop them, you know, uh, it would, it would take the, the state of Minnesota sh to shut them down. And I, I don't know if Governor Walls is going to do that tomorrow or not. Um, I would guess not. Uh, but you know, we have no control or say, you know, all we can do is control what we have and control what we do. And, you know, this would limit their space that they would have available in Bloomington, at least, uh, as well. Um, through the non-rentals that are not going to be allowed during the same period. And Director Stark, this is very similar to the situation with the non-publics and K-12 inconsistency. Right. And the other inconsistency was, um, you know, sh it was either shortly before or shortly after our last board meeting um, Anoka Hennepin, no, it was the same night as our last board meeting two weeks ago. Anoka Hennepin school board voted five to one to keep their um, activities and athletics running, even though they were going to a distance learning model, which, you know, uh, the initial reaction was, oh my goodness, so Anoka Hennepin's totally going against state guidelines. Mm -hmm. And then like three days later, the Department of Education says, no, it's actually, it's actually fine. So I, I don't know if you guys can feel my frustration. This decision is just in making me very, very frustrated because it seems like the, the, just the guidance coming from the state is clear as mud. It seems like to make it from a district to district decision when Kennedy and Jefferson are competing with other con schools within our conference and why it's not a universal decision across conferences. 
why there's not this distinction between why district sponsored sports and club sponsored sports are treated differently. Like it, it's really bothering me a lot. So, which I think you all can feel. I know there's no answers. There's no answers for anybody here on this on this meeting to to share. I just want folks to know that that's that's where I'm coming from. Thank you, Director Starks. Director Bennett. Um, yes, yeah, so Mr. Anderson, you were talking about how where our fall sports are currently, and you were saying how some of them would be continue would wouldn't finish the season until after November twentieth. Like I think you're saying football, they might have a playoff game after, or something like that. Is do you think that I don't know if you want to give your opinion, but I mean, would it make sense for us to extend that the ending of that until after fall sports are completed or I don't know if administration wants to stick to that November 20th date. I don't know if anyone wants to speak about that at all. Um, you know, the recommendation is, is the 20th. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to um, what would happen beyond that. You know, like I said, football playoffs start the 17th. Uh, with a potential second round game if if either team won uh, to be either that Friday or that Saturday um, with the potential section final to be you know you typically the Saturday after Thanksgiving uh, volleyball would have an additional week after Thanksgiving uh, or that they, that those first three days of thanks before Thanksgiving is gonna the last few days of the regular season with the playoffs to start afterwards um, so I mean the dates the 20th um, that's the recommendation. Okay. I know it makes it problematic, but I'm just thinking of those, those kids that are playing now, it would be horrible to, to make the playoffs and have an opportunity to go play in the playoffs. And then, oh, it's on the 21st. You can't play <laughs> you know, because we're yeah. cutting off on the 20th. That's kind of what, yeah. what my concern is. Yeah. And I, I totally understand it. And I, I would feel awful for those kids. Yeah. So I don't know if the administration is, uh, thinks it's, best to stick with the 20th or if that's some type of leeway that administration would want to consider or the rest of the board would want to consider i don't know can open up the conversation or dr bennett this is the guidance that we receive from the our health care professionals okay okay that's good thank you director Beebe. Um, I, I agree with Director Bennett. It's really going to be hard on those students that don't get to finish off with this being the time that we will have to, as it were, close down. Um, but I also, in, in light of what um, Director Stark said, I think it actually speaks to the role of the community. It's like if we as a school are doing everything we can, and then we have other outlying groups that are allowed to do things, it, it begins to defeat the work that we're doing in our school. And so I speak to the community out there and I say, I know you want your kids in these programs, but this is a different time in history and we may have to act very differently in order to get things under control and that goes against what i want i want these kids to have all these opportunities but i also want this pandemic to start to settle down for the sake of everybody in the community so i'm just making a statement and also showing support for director starks and her frustration thank you director Beatty. any other questions Oh, Director Starks. Yeah, so thank you, Director Beebe. And I also wanted to share my, I um, I had the same thoughts as Director Bennett about allowing our fall sports to continue until they naturally end. Um, I think November 20th is just, it's a date we're picking out of the air because it's a Friday. And I think that we need to allow those, those fall sports to just end organically as they do. And it may be organically means we have an outbreak or their competitors have an outbreak or the conference can't run um, activities, but it, it I, I support that idea of allowing at least our full sports to, to finish 
on their own. Anyone else? No? Okay. Director Starch, you still have, oh, um, Director also, let's go with you. I, I'm just thinking that <clears throat> if the ending date for school is Friday and the fall sports end on that weekend, that, that might be a little bit different than if they end, you know, a couple of weeks later. Okay. If there's no other comments about it, should we continue then? Let's continue, um, Superintendent. Great, thank you, Chair Corbin. Administration drafted a resolution. I believe you have it in your with you, and this resolution uh, okay. aligns with the recommendations in that planning calendar chart that was just reviewed by the presenters. Yeah. Thank you, Superintendent, and thank you to all presenters tonight. Um, so let's go to that resolution. If someone uh, would like to read it, uh, we could we could go into discussion and then ask more questions if needed. But we do have a resolution in front of us, so I guess we gotta look at that first. Okay, Director, I think I saw Director Olson's hand before. No, Director Bennett. Yeah, I'll go ahead and read the resolution. Uh, be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 271 adopts instructional model movements as follows. Elementary grades K through five moving from hybrid to distance learning with the last day of hybrid being no later than November 20th, 2020. Middle school grades six through 12 to remain in distance learning. High school grades nine, I mean, middle school grades six through eight to remain in distance learning. High school grades nine through 12 to remain in distance learning early learning services, last day no later than November 20th, 2020. In addition, the last day of the following programs activities will be no later than November 20th. Elementary after school programs, targeted services at the middle school, athletics and activities, facility rentals. Model movement along with programs and activities will be reevaluated during the first week of January, 2021. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Steigoff. Okay, was we'll moved by Director Bennett and second by Director Steigoff. Uh, okay, discussion. Director Bennett. Yeah, um, just picking up on the conversation we're just having about the sports. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I, I would really like to see the fall sports have a, I guess, organically end date as, as a director starts put it. So um, I would like to make a motion to amend this, this resolution to allow for that. So for to allow for fall sports to end organically. I'll second that motion. Okay, so we have a motion that was uh, moved by Director Bennett and it was second by Director Starks. Any um, Comments on that? Any discussion? Director Olson? Microphone. I'm very torn because I can understand this, um, but on one hand, we're saying, you know, community take this seriously. And, you know, if kids and families are having to stop school and they're seeing athletics continue? Are they um, feeling that we are prioritizing? Um, and then on the other hand, I also know that, you know, some of those athletics are are, are safer than others. So um, I don't know where I stand here. Director Beebe. Yeah. I. I would like to see the, the athletics end organically. It looks like we're all at this time. Um, and I believe that um, um, 
A.D. Anderson um, said that it would be completed by the last week of um, last week of, of November, beginning of December. So um, I am for supporting that amendment. Director Sorum. Yeah, I guess, you know, the, the term organically is, is probably confusing to me and a lot of other people. I mean, is that just so that the sports, volleyball, and football can continue through the playoffs? Yes. Okay, and the other winter sports would continue after January 1st? No. Or would they not be available at all? Potentially. Huh. Well, I guess I support the organically aspect, but the overall one I probably won't support. Director um, Steiger. I guess I agree with Director Olson that um, as much as I want them to finish, I feel like um, we're supposed to be about education. And if we have students that are struggling and we can't get into school, does it send a message that we're prioritizing sports over school? But I also feel, I mean, I kind of agree with Director Starks, I'm I'm completely split on this. Um, they let it end organically. So I guess before I can vote, I have a question in here. Um, we've only talked about volleyball and football. Are there any other sports that this would affect if we said end organically? Because I don't want to have a surprise, something that we didn't think about. And I just want to make sure that's it before we vote on that. John Anderson, could you help us, please? You muted, John. Sorry. Uh, the only two current sports that are happening are football and volleyball. All other fall sports have completed their seasons already. Uh, football and volleyball were part of that delayed it's kind of fall two season. Uh, after the high school league uh, re-implemented those seasons after initially voting to push the start to March. Uh, so that's why they're running so late. Uh, normally, uh, football uh, would be into the state tournament at this point, which is like a three week long state tournament. Uh, the winter sports, uh, for the most part, aren't scheduled to start until the 23rd or the 30th. Uh, so if we were uh, pushed into you know the, the distance learning in this fashion, those sports would start in virtual coaching so they would be meeting virtually with their coaches uh until that point in which we were allowed to come back and have in-person practices and competitions can i have a follow-up there director corman director steiger go ahead um so for football would only really affect football is if if teams made the playoffs correct so in Minnesota, every team makes the playoffs, okay? Uh, so the first round playoff game is scheduled for Tuesday the 17th. So they would play that uh, regardless. Okay. If they won that game, depending on um, the section in which they play, their second round game would either be Friday the 20th or Saturday the 21st, with the final game potentially would be the Saturday after Thanksgiving. I guess I should have clarified my question if they made it through the first round. Um, but then can you explain the volleyball a little more detail? Um, how much contact that would be, how many practices, how many, you know, the details of what that would involve for how many days? Sure. So uh, those first three days of the week on Thanksgiving week, the 23rd, 24th, 25th, okay? Uh, I know Jefferson has, or excuse me, Kennedy has a game on the 
3rd. Uh, they travel to Hopkins, which is their last regular game of the season. I believe in my conversations with, with uh, Chad Nyberg, the Jefferson AD, that he said that Jefferson has two volleyball games that week. I'm quickly pulling up their schedule to take a look at it. Um, yeah, they play Monday the 23rd and then again on Wednesday the 25th. Um, at that point, the following Monday for both teams on Monday the 30th, that is when the first round of their playoffs begin. Um, playoffs continue uh, really potentially through, uh, I believe, that second week in December. So that would be, as I pull up my calendar, potentially up until, um, you know, December 11th, I believe, is the last possible day that that, that, that volleyball playoffs can last. Because typically section playoffs are about two weeks. So it could potentially last until then. And once we get to the playoffs, it all depends on how uh, how long the team goes and wins. Thank you. Director Starks. So I kind of forgot my question because I know Mr. Anderson uh, uh, talked about what one thing I was going to bring up was that the football and volleyball had been delayed already. So it's not their fault that they're they're this long. Um, and then I'm going to go on to another question. So one other thing, I don't know how we need to address this, but facilities rental, if, if, uh, volleyball is going to be using school district facilities, we might need to lump that in this change too, so that they can still use district facilities if we're allowing vo the volleyball to finish on their own FYI, just in case, I don't know if that's getting too in the weeds. What happened to everybody? <laughs> was, that, was that a comment or a question? You know what? It was supposed to be a question and it ended not in a question. So my apologies. I'm having a lot going on right now. Thank you. I also had a full day of hybrid, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> Director Vivi, or maybe Director Olson first, if you don't mind. Well, because I was just adding to Director Starks to this would also affect right, um, custodians and other people involved in opening up for, for uh, volleyball. Is there anybody else that it would affect? Bus drivers, transportation? No, that's a question. John, can you handle that one as far as bus drivers? Would yeah. Bus yeah. Yes, I can, I can handle that. Yes, you know, um, potentially it would be bus drivers. I know that, that that first game that we have on that Monday the 23rd is an away game uh, at Hopkins. I believe at least one of the two games that Jefferson has in those few days before um, Thanksgiving, yes, uh, they play at Benilde St. Margaret's. Uh, I'm confident that our volleyball team would be on the road for their first playoff game. Uh, so we would need drivers for that. Um, you know, Jefferson hosts a game on the 25th. So they would have to have custodial staff set up and take down uh, for that event as well. Uh, volleyball has been allowing spectators. They're allowing, they allow, they're allowed up to two spectators who have pre-registered with the school. Um, for those events. Um, so I, I don't, that would have to be a, a decision that if this was allowed to, if that event was allowed to happen, how would we react and how would we handle that situation? Uh, so there, it, it, this does impact other groups. Thank you. Director Bennett. Oh, my questions were were answered by other other board members asked good questions. So I was actually clicking my lower hand button when you called on me. <laughs> Director Steig. Oh, okay. That hand went down too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I also um, you know, I'm kind of in the, the similar position as Director Olson and Director Steig, where I 
go back and forth, you know, is this gonna um, cause a possible outbreak between our athletes at, you know, any point in the next few weeks as we continue to, um, you know, to postpone this decision or, or allow it to end organically, as you have called it. Um, so if this, let's say that, um, that this is approved and then the teams continue to play, um, and let's say that there is an issue, you know, where we have um, to worry about an outbreak in the next couple of weeks, I'm guessing this will have to come back to the board, correct? To reverse that decision. If we have, we, we get into some sort of an emergency moment where we see several of our athletes getting sick. Clarification, Chair Corman, are you saying that the resolution would not be approved as stated? Uh, um, no, let's say that if we um, go, if we move forward with this um, amendment. Oh, okay. If you change yeah. the resolution as proposed and you that volleyball so, football, the season would end at the last game of postseason, of any postseason game, if any. That would be sort of the amendment. And if something happens in between the last season of the postseason, last game of the postseason, could we end it earlier? Because yeah. of the outbreak? Sure, the board can always take action to do that. But it will have to come back to the board, correct? Well, unless, you, you um, unless you make that part of your amendment. Okay. I, okay. Director Sorum. Well, if a positive, positive test comes out somewhere during all of this sort of stuff, I think they would probably have to postpone the game or cancel mm -hmm. the game. Isn't that true? Um, I'm going to call on um, Ms. Hatch again to... Yeah, so if our athletes are testing positive or coaches or things like that, then yes, we would follow that contact tracing process and we would uh, implement the isolation and quarantine according to the state. So that would not be something that would uh, need to be approved. There are times where that does shut down a whole team or part of a team in certain instances. So one thing to consider is football is a sport where you have a lot of close contact just by the nature of the sport. Um, the benefit of it is they're outside, which has helped with ventilation. However, uh, we what we look at is, did you have close contact with other individuals uh, for a cumulative of 15 minutes? So when you look at playtime, even though it could be quick in and out, if it adds up to 15 minutes, then that's several people who get quarantined. And if we don't know for sure who was exposed, then we err on the side of caution. With volleyball, it's not quite as uh, close contact when you think about it that way. They're not having physical contact with each other constantly. However, they are indoors. So just something to think through uh, in considering it. Thank you. Mr. Kaufman. I was just gonna reiterate that based on the work of our contact tracing, if we have a positive case, we isolate and con close contacts are quarantined for 14 days. So in essence, anything that comes up yet this week would likely um, end the season for those teams, depending on how widespread it is. Okay, thank you. Director Steiger. Well, I wanted to know, does, is the state high school league, is there any um, talk that they would implement testing before those playoffs begin of, of all the teams so that you would know when you went to playoffs if anybody tested positive before they got there? And then also, it's the same for our athletes. If we know that that age group often is asymptomatic, so right now they're only getting tested if they have symptoms or they've had an exposure. So we could have many people being asymptomatic and we wouldn't know it, is that correct? Anna, you wanna take that please? Yes, that is true that we could have students and staff who are asymptomatic and we don't know and they are spreading it. So that is definitely true. I personally have not heard talk of testing athletes prior to playoffs at this time. Uh, not that that can't come or won't be something in the future, but 
right now I have not heard that talk going around. Uh, you are correct that most people being tested are only being tested when they are either exposed, have a known exposure, or exhibiting symptoms. Uh, but with the community testing events, there are options for people to be tested that don't have symptoms, and we're hoping that becomes more readily available to athletes as well. John, have you heard anything about testing? Before? Uh, sorry, we, we've heard nothing about testing of athletes before playoff games. Um, just much like Hannah just said, we, we've only even told people to get tests if they are symptomatic or have been around somebody who has been, if they've been in close contact. Okay, uh, I'm going to go with Director Bennett and then Director Olson. Yeah, when I was saying, you know, inorganically, the reason why I use that term, and it was a good term from Heather, but and not the end date, is because if there's an outbreak tomorrow, then the season will be canceled. So that's ending organically. So that's <laughs> why um, that's why I said organically, not the actual end date, because it could end a lot sooner than November 20th anyway. Point, Director Bennett, Director Olson. Um, I I do want to mention as I'm thinking about it, without a lot of time to think about it, that I do feel better about the fact that they aren't going to then be going into the classroom afterward. Um, I just I just hope that the community, because I'm sure they're really wanting this to happen and you know my my uh son played lacrosse and i know he would be heartbroken if he didn't get to play his last playoff game um so i i know that the community is going to really want this to happen and i i don't want to be the one to break anybody's hearts so i just want to say that i would go along with this but Again, I'm begging the community to please take this seriously because these decisions are all based on everyone cooperating. And I'm just not seeing it. I'm not seeing the community cooperating like I, as I would like, so, or as the governor would like. So um, that all of these decisions are based on that. And I really hope that that you help us here. Yeah, definitely the choices of our community will uh, definitely impact our students. And uh, for our students, you know, if we move forward with this too, uh, please take good care of yourselves. You know that you are going to be playing, please um, consider, you know, how you can um, stay safe as much as you can, but maybe not, you know, participating in too many social events outside of this, um, of your games. Okay, so let's um, then vote on this amendment. And uh, Director Bennett, I would ask you to please to uh, reinstate your amendment just so that the public knows again what you're voting on right now. Uh, Director Bennett, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's Sorry. my turn to turn my microphone on. <laughs> so yeah, the amendment was to just allow for our fall sports to end organically. So that's just football and volleyball and, and everything else is the same. And to have that change of language in the resolution that will be, we will be addressing the resolution with the recommendation. Okay, so, and that was- that's good and enough for uh, Mr. Holman and it's good enough for me. I think you might want to state that you're going to allow football and volleyball end on uh, at the end of the uh, Minnesota State High School League playoffs, if not earlier, if uh, they close up. Thank you, Mr. Holman. Uh, okay, Director Bennett, try it again. Um, well, just what Mr. Holman said, to allow for football and volleyball to continue until the the Playoffs are done at the latest. Is that good enough, Mr. Holman? Yes. 
Yeah, I'm asking Director Bennett because you are the one who brought the, yes. the motion. So, uh, and it was second by Director Starks. And so let's all vote. So all those in favor of this amendment to our resolution, please say aye. Director Bibi. Aye. Director Bennett. Aye. Director Olson. Aye. Director Sorum. Aye. Director Starks. Aye. Director Steigoff. Aye. And Corman, aye. So the amendment has passed. So now let's go back to our resolution. Any comments on that resolution as it is plus the amendment? Any discussion? Oh, Director Olson. I see the hands now. <laughs> Director Olson, you're muted. I'm sorry. I keep free until um, no, I, I am okay with the resolution. Okay. Director Starks. Um, so I have a concern about canceling uh, winter sports and activities. And I, and I think canceling is probably the wrong word. So um, if like Director Anderson, if you want to maybe um, correct me on that. But so it's my understanding that the winter activities can still happen virtually. They just can't happen in person. Is that, am I correct on that? Yeah, you are correct. We would move to virtual coaching. Uh, is the is the term the Minnesota State High School League uses, uh, where coaches would be able to meet uh, in a format to what we are doing right now uh, with their teams. Um, you know, conduct, um, they learn the plays. They would work on team building, uh, all those things that you would try to do as best possible over a virtual format like this. And so no competitions no in-person practices uh no competitions the coach could provide workouts for the athletes to do on their own independently uh but, but they could not gather together okay and then another follow-up to that is activities because this is not just athletics that's so correct can you talk about um what that means for like middle school plays or a uh, math team or some any of the other activities show choir i think you mentioned yep uh all those activities as well would shift to a virtual format uh and they would have to uh work together uh to figure out what that means in, in particular for their for their event i know that our show choir program has is already in development of a possible uh, virtual program that they would follow. Uh, I know uh, Ms. Jordan has been pretty proactive working out the possibilities of things that may happen that she, they've seen the case rates go up themselves and trying to prepare their program. I know for math team that though that those competitions and those practices were gonna be 100% virtual this year anyways. Okay. Um, so uh, the teams make adjustments. Uh, they will work within the parameters they have. Obviously, they would all say, and the athletes and, and the coaches and the students and the advisors and the participants would all say they'd rather gather together and be able to work together. Uh, but uh, they're resilient and, and they will make do with what we allow them or what they can do. Okay, thank you. I, I think my concern is, you know, I know that there are several students where the athletics and activities are really what keeps them drawn to school. And so I want to make sure that we're able to do as much as we can to keep those kids connected to, to, the, to the coaches, to the staff, to their, to their peers, um, which I know all of our staff in Bloomington will do. I just, that's the hardest part for me about this particular section of the vote is knowing that there are so many students that really use athletics and activities as their connection to their school community, uh, more so than the academics. Um, and, and then a sport like Nordic, which is outside and inherently six feet away, to not allow them to compete is also another place where, you know, I recognize that we really shouldn't be separating out different activities and different athletics, but 
that's heartbreaking too because i feel like there are some um some that we could potentially still run in person but i understand uh the reasons behind why we wouldn't do that thank you director sorum your microphone is off yeah until when are we saying they're canceled for the next year or are they going to start up March 1st? If we maintain a virtual practices and everything else for a while, I know uh, the hockey team, Jefferson hockey team is playing. Mr. Anderson, is that? Uh, you know, my understanding is with this, the teams will, will stay in a virtual coaching mode uh, as long as we are under the, as we re continue to review the information, the metrics, uh, you know, Hannah and, and her team continue to review those. Then they will um, continue to be in that until we tell them they don't have to be in that any longer because of what the metrics are telling us. You know, it could be uh, it sounds like we're going to reevaluate in early January. It could be back as soon as that. Um, you know, it could be later, depending on the metrics. You know, as Dr. Kelly said before, you know, we can't, you know, they make some projections of what is going to happen based on um, the holidays coming up and what has happened before, but they can't say with, with, with certainty what's, what's going to happen down the road. I guess, you know, I guess in this, um, the last day of the, for the following programs will be no later than November 20th. We almost need it. And then it says to be reevaluated during the first week of January. I guess that's an end date there. But at the same time, you know, uh, I know, I know some of the teams are, are actually playing. And so whatever that means, are we stopping that now, you know, for hockey? Well, can I answer that? Yeah, Chad. So are you talking about like the bridge season? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so <clears throat> Jefferson doesn't have a team. Well, their girls might have a team in it. I don't think the boys do. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like that's the that's kind of the million dollar question of what people are going to do as a reaction to this, right? Will they not participate in the high school stuff, right, virtually, and will arenas and other facilities continue to rent out ice sheets, right? Like the this is the this is where the drama comes into this, right? Cuz we control gyms. We don't control rinks. We don't control ski hills and that type of stuff. So I think that's what uh, Director Starks is kind of getting at and to some level. But yeah, this is the this is the challenge with all of this. Um, some sports are, I'll, I'll use the term, figure it out and do other things, right? Um, and there's nothing that we can do to prevent that. And if, you know, there's some high school league language around things that we, John and I, would have to advise kids on, right? Because you can't be duly enrolled in in the high school program, as well as uh, another team, like a member of this bridge season that Sorum is talking about. Um, so there'd have to be some, yeah, clarity given to kids on, uh, so they don't, if, if we're able to hopefully get back into this at the high school level um, through high school programming, that those kids wouldn't be ineligible. Right, and I guess the big concern is evaluation in January first week in January, then everything seems to be, oh, hey, this is fine. It's dropped down. Go ahead, play sports, according to the, <clears throat> according to the high school league schedules then. <clears throat> wow, okay. Okay, Director Starks. So Director Sorum, you're, you're bringing up exactly my frustration. This is why I really, really wish this was an M -A -M -S -H, Minnesota State High School League decision or at, at the minimum a conference league decision or uh, that there was a you know, statewide decision about closing arenas and closing gyms and closing you know, all of those things. It, it, it just feels 
really awkward and weird and wrong that this is a district by district decision um, and that it's not a more universal coordinated effort. So that I'm definitely struggling with that. I mean, yes. Can I add just mm -hmm. to it? So, you know, that is if, if we followed this back to last spring, the high school league was getting, you know, destroyed by making a universal decision and the districts wanted the flexibility, at least at that point. And now, now it's flipping back, right. In terms of wanting that. So it's out of our hands and we're just following it. So that's that they're not going to get involved. They did it once. My opinion is it does not feel like they're going to get involved um, based on what we've seen, right? Just the, the upheaval uh, around the state because what's happening in one part may not be happening in another part. And that's where it gets tricky for them to be unilateral unless it comes top down from the, the governor's office. Right, John? That's correct. And and there's, the high school league does not want to get involved. They they failed burned by the last time and they've been burned enough. They, they don't want to do it anymore. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Going back to the resolution or all the other areas of the resolution, anything else? Other board members? No? So are we ready to vote? Looks like good. Uh, okay, so with the resolution that we have, all those in favor of approving this resolution tonight, with that amendment included, uh, please say aye. So, Director Bibi, aye. Director Bennett, aye. Director Olson, aye. Director Sorum, aye. Director Starks. Aye. Director Steiger. Aye. And Corman, aye. This resolution has passed. Um, thank you very much to administration and all members of your team. Uh, every single person that has been part of, uh, you know, getting to this presentation, collecting the data, uh, finding out more information, you know, all different points. So thank you for bringing that up. And, um, you know, as we approve this, once again, you know, we are talking about the date of the 20th, but administration had also made it clear that if there is a need, if there is an outbreak, or if, you know, we have um, staffing issues, that this is a decision that might need to be um, done earlier. I mean, this might need to happen next week or any time before uh, the 20th, so for everybody, all members of the community and school community to remember. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. No. Thank you, Jim Carl. Thank you to the school board. And thank you everybody for staying with us. Yes, thank you. Thank you everyone for being patient. This is a lot. I, I mean, I am totally understand how this feels for um, every single member of our community, our parents, so, you know, it's a lot of, empathy that goes um, to you for you know what you have experienced in your own families and for our educators too in the schools every day what this and especially for our students this is really especially really hard on our students not being able to go to school not being able to participate of activities not being able to have full supports every single day um, yeah this is really hard so you know thank you uh okay let's let's move on to board member reports does anybody have any reports for tonight are we passing into the next the following week yes looks like director steiger i just have quickly that the pathways advisory committee met um and of course there were new members so part of the um discussion was the actual purpose of the committee and then uh, the presentation on safe and supportive schools was there because that committee has not met since that was passed. So they had that presentation. Also the learning models update, um, same presentations we've been having. And then um, that, you know, that committee reviews curriculum. So they went over the process to reviewing curriculum. And so just a couple notes on that. Um, the K-12 science 
is beginning phase two of review. Um, state level science standards had a large change. So MDU has given districts extra time to implement them. Um, so teams of teachers will complete material selection, create units or courses in all areas. And then they'll take that back to that committee, the prioritized standards for that committee to review. Um, and then the K-12 English language arts is also beginning phase one. And the same thing, it's teams of teachers study best practice, align and prioritize standards and begin material selection. And then once all that process is done, that also goes to the Pathways Advisory Committee because they also um, review all of our curriculum too. So thank you. Thank you. Director Olson. I just wanted to mention that before this meeting, we had the Bloomington Student Advisory Council with the middle schoolers, which Dr. Mishler did a wonderful job presenting and Director BB did a wonderful job cheering and uh, Director Starks and I were lucky to attend. Um, the students, I just have to say, I was so impressed with our middle school students in that group. They were absolutely amazing. They asked excellent questions. They had an excellent discussion and they had, they offered excellent ideas. So we even talked about meeting more than our scheduled meetings. They raised their hands that they would like to do so. So that was impressive as well. Thank you. Well, I just really quick want to bring up um, a note that is in the, the Bloomington Public Schools Facebook page about Oak Grove Middle School, something that I've been meaning to mention before. Um, there was, uh, I, I'll just read it really quick. Um, Kudos to Old Grove Middle School staff and generous community members for their creative collaboration on this project to get bikes in the hands of Old Grove Middle School students. During distance learning, Old Grove Middle School by a teacher, Jenny Berglund, uh, Jenny Berglund wanted to encourage students to get outside and ride a bike and log their time doing so. To help ensure students had access to bikes, the PE team put out calls for bike donations and received more than 40 bikes as well as funds to put toward Oak Grove Middle School, our teacher Gabby Erickson and her husband Ted, an avid bicyclist, set up a bike shop in their garage, cleaning, tuning up, and replacing parts on the incoming bikes. Over the next month, Bergland, Dean of Students, John Paul Hill, social worker Eric Jacobson, and counselor Mike Shitman, I'm sorry if I didn't say it right, deliver bikes to students' homes often with a treat and some encouraging words to stay strong during distance learning. So thank you very much, uh, all of you, for uh, this amazing initiative. When I heard about that, I was I was very happy for our students. You know, it's something that that we're doing that is it's going to make a positive uh, impact in this in the life of our students. So thank you. Anybody else other reports? No. Okay. So we'll go to superintendent reports. Thank you, Chair Corbin. I just have one thing. The Bloomington Public Schools Advocacy Council under the leadership of Chair Dennis Kane is hosting a virtual leadership forum with our local legislators on Monday, November 16th at 6 p.m. It'll be televised by TBC TV. School board members have been invited and plan to attend the forum. So please tune in. Back to you, Chair Corbin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other business? So it's time for adjournment. Uh, I'd like to move adjournment of the meeting. Is there a second? Second, Stagoff. Thank you. All those in favor on adjourning the meeting, please say aye. Director Bibi. Aye. Director Bennett. Aye. Director Olson. Aye. Director Sorum. Aye. Director St Starks? Aye. Director Steigoff? Aye. And Corman, aye. I don't think I missed anyone. So this, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for staying this late with us. Thank you, BCTV.